that for granted. Kalibuni, Kalibuni, uh, our program is about to start in the next uh, few minutes. For now, those of us who want to take pictures, and uh, we've been talking about tech all through. Please, can we tweet? When we take these pictures, can we let the world know that we are in Arusha? And most importantly, that we are gathered as well as in Arusha. Let's take these pictures, let's tweet the pictures, share with all our contacts, and let them know that uh, it's happening, it's going down in uh, Arusha uh, for our 27th uh, conference. So next couple of minutes, uh, I'll just give us a few minutes to catch up, take a few pictures, then we shall dive straight into the program of the day.
Hello, Kate Tower 6. Our case director is in the house, and the various uh, building tools. Uh, Honorable Cabinet Secretary, uh, Office of the President, the Chairman, Ms. Harriet uh, Chigai. Honorable Vice President of the EACJ, Justice uh, Mr. Kaudoya. In especially, I also like to recognize uh, Lady Justice uh, Kamana Mediakuf. I hope I got that right. From the Supreme Court of um, Supreme Court of Burundi. Kids, I want to use uh, two languages, if permit me. I will start with Swahili, a bit of Kinyarwanda, and lastly uh, English. If you open the booklet, you will see the name there as the organizing chair. Mimi mwenye kitu wa maandalizi ya mkutano mkuu wa mawakili wa Jumuiya ya Kimataifa. Rafiki ninao kwa kuwakaribisha kwenye mkutano wetu wa 27 wa mawakili wa Jumuiya ya Afrika Mashariki. Tunawashukuru kwa kujitoa kwa hali na mali kufanikisha huo mkutano. Tunashukuru kwa kutenga muda wenu kujarusha kujiunga nasi. Natakia sana mkutano mwema alifona na siku njema. To our friends from uh, Rwanda and Burundi, allow me change the language a bit. Mwaram Samos, the Yamri Yangu, the ELS. Amazin and it were Ronald Murumbo. Nkanda Wai Murbozi. We live in the Chango Conference. Twai Kaze Mujo Arusha. Travashi Mecha Nukitanje. Mwanya Mahai Idin Hurido. Mako the Chano Kufatanga. Nato Punchuro Yamakuba de Nakarinde, Yirifuru, Bifur Jeriviza, Mia Rusha, Yazur Misa, Mrakuze. Friends, allow me now to address uh, my friends and brothers and sisters from uh, Uganda. A very good morning. In the same way, my name is Ronald Mwenda. I have been the conference chair for this 27th East Africa Legislative Conference and Assembly. I would like to thank President Bonham for giving me this opportunity to serve. Where I come from, there's something we call service above self. I am a Rotarian. When we give ourselves a minute to serve, we give our all. We put in our energy and resources to do this. I am here in my capacity as a lawyer practicing in Uganda a member of this community, but most importantly, serving you as your conference chair. Thank you very much for your time, resources, and making this happen. Friends, in case anything didn't go right, I am the guy to blame. But in case anything went right, give credit to Be President Bernard. And you can also whisper to me, Ronald, you did an amazing job. But most importantly, we just want to take feedback for the team that is coming after us. So we shall encourage us to give us feedback. Tell us what went wrong. And for the 28th assembly or conference, I hope we can do better. Friends, at this point in time, allow me to thank the organizing committee that put this together. Our sponsors, leading law firms, as we said, the 10 years and of course, counting many more years that will come after us. Uh, thank you, thank you very, very much. I hope you're enjoying your stay in Russia. We try to keep our sessions as short as we could by ending at one or maybe two to just allow you time to go and explore uh, Russia. President, as the organizing uh, quality chair, I would like to keep it at this and say thank you very, very, very much for the opportunity. Uh, to serve him. At this point in time, if you may permit me, allow me to invite
the president of Tanganyika Law Society. I think it's delayed a bit. We shall have him uh, along the way. Uh, president Bernard, as the president, uh, uh, wait for uh, Professor Zaya. Could you please uh, come through? And here come uh, your delegates. A big round of applause as we receive our president. Good morning, members. Good morning, members. Good. Um, on behalf of the East Africa Law Society Governing Council, I want in a special way to thank you first. And since I have just learned some, um, to say thank you in, 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 uh, in, 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 Rwanda, how you say thank you in Rwanda or Burundi. So I'll just say Morocco is a So since I'm a quick learner, I at least have learned that one. And uh, let me also in a special way thank our guests. I want to thank my Lord, Judge and President of the East African Court of Justice, Justice Nesta Kayovera. Let me thank Honorable Harriet Chigai, who, by the way, served as a vice president of the East Africa Law Society, if I remember quite well, yes. Um, so we, we are grateful that uh, the president of Kenya saw it wise to appoint one of our very active members. If you are very active in ELS, you m could not have missed uh, Honorable Harriet. Let me also thank our past presidents. I have past president Richard Mugisha. As you know, we continue to build on the foundations built by our past leaders. But we also have our founding member. Is he here already? The first founding member of the East Africa Law Society. I think he'll come in at some point. Let me thank um, our former registrar of the East African Court of Justice. I request him to stand up so that you can all see him. We did a lot of work with him in terms of advocacy for the East African Court of Justice. So I know we've never said thank you, so I just want to say thank you for the work that you did with the East Africa Law Society. Let me also introduce past president of the Commonwealth Association, our good friend, President Santhan, <laughs> who now we're indebted to, to, we now have to go to the Commonwealth annual general meeting in India. So I'm also reminding you, I'm sure he has made that call when he, when he meets some of you. Uh, we need to participate in, in that also. And our guest speaker yesterday, the leading law, law dinner, leading lawyers dinner and in-house council dinner, uh, Mr. Peter Maynard. Thank you so much. Um, governing council members, I'll just ask those who are present. I think I have the Secretary General. Secretary General, some people may not know you, so you just stand up so that at least they see you. Our General Secretary from Burundi. <laughs> and and please note the kind of wave he, he, he gives. Um, let me also welcome um, Ambassador Tajiro. Thank you so much for coming. The TLS president is also here, Professor Hosea, thank you. <laughs> the Peter Secretary General, thank you. <laughs> the incoming president of uh, East Africa Law Society. Who, 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 have you met the incoming president of East Africa Law Society? Not yet? Y do, you, do you want to guess who it is? But if you have not met him, how will you guess, right? So let me ask him also to stand up so that you can see him. <laughs> F 
from the Tanganyika Law Society. And so before I invite our moderator this morning, and we are going to have a very interesting session, I cannot wait to hear what um, the Honorable Minister has to say. She's always hard hitting, speaks, um, she's candid, and speaks her mind. That's what I know about her. So I'm very sure uh, we're going to um, get a very interesting discussion. And if you think that she's very candid, wait for the judge president. Uh, he's candid and he speaks his mind. That is what I've also learned from all my friends from Burundi. The there is no middle ground. X is X, Y is Y. Period. Yeah. Um, so before I invite the moderator, let me share a joke. In the last days of uh, uh, Robert Mugabe, the late Robert Mugabe of Zimbabwe, uh, you know he ruled uh, up to the age of about, I think, 85. 85 or, or, or 90 or something close to that. And so journalists kept asking him that when, he's, when, is, when, he, when will he say bye to his people? And his response was always, where will they be going? <laughs> so Robert Mugabe was that intellectual who had every answer. And on, on an, and on another occasion, newspapers kept reporting that he had passed on. So you know how newspapers say, oh, Robert Mugabe has passed on. So when the press asked him, he said, these newspapers which keep reporting that I have passed on, and they never report when I resurrect, I don't know what's wrong with them. <laughs> so that was Robert Mugabe for you. Um, I have also seen the executive di director of East Africa Business Council. Please uh, stand up for recognition, Mr. Kalisa. <laughs> Mr. Kalisa, the lawyers have told me to tell you that they are ready to support you. We are ready to support you. Please call on us and we'll support East African business. So allow me invite our moderator, past president Richard Mugisha, who I believe is well known to most of us, except for the younger lawyers who may have not who may not know him. So past president, please come and uh, take over your session. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, President Owundo. Uh, good morning, everyone. I hope you are recovering from the party. Uh, as, as is the tradition here, we, we, we have to combine work and party. This is what makes the conference memorable. Uh, we have uh, a very interesting topic uh, for discussion this morning. And uh, it's the dream of a unified East African community, the role of lawyers and the ESC partner states, quite a packed um, topic. I believe that everyone here this morning believes in the grand ESC project and is committed to contributing its quarter to its realization. Our keynote address on the subject will be delivered by Honorable Harriet Igonanga Chigai, Cabinet Secretary, uh, in the office of the President of the Republic of Kenya, um, in the portfolio of Advisor on Women, women Rights. Um, Honorable Harriet Chigai is someone I know very well, having served with her as my Vice President of the East African Law Society from, for the period 2016 to 2018. She's an extremely passionate individual about leadership, governance, youth mentorship, as well as development. She was nominated uh, 
to many accolades, including in 2015 as the phenomenal Africa Woman of the Year, based on her contribution to mentorship programs, transformative leadership, and governance. She's an expert on corporate governance, audit and risk, board management, and so uh, you will all agree with me that we could not have had a better presenter for, 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 this, for this topic. Um, Honorable Chigai has got a very long uh, profile, which I will omit uh, to read so that we can save time, given that we are running behind schedule. Um, on that note, please join me in welcoming Honorable Chigai to deliver her remarks. Thank you very much, President Mugisha. Good morning, East Africa. We are very dull this morning. Let us stand up and shake your neighbor's hands and welcome them to this session. Just stand up. <laughs> Introduce yourself in your language. <laughs> in your language. <laughs> and for those of us who went out last night, That is better, isn't it? <coughs> All right. That is purely East African way of saying hello. <laughs> All right, we can now take our seats. We can now take our seats. All right. From what I see, it is clear that some of us had not even met. The hugs are longer, the discussions have been elongated, and we are still hugging each other. That is the East African spirit, isn't it? Good. <coughs> so good morning once again. Um, when I was asked to speak today, I asked myself, what really am I going to tell East African lawyers? given the fact we've had these discussions over and over and over again. In the last sessions that we had, the discussions were purely academic. And my question over time has been, have we analyzed the milestones that we have made? We have various uh, senior lawyers seated here, and I kept asking myself, if Chacha Odera was not the one standing here, giving this topic, why me? A girl, I've just reminded her that she was my teacher. She can't remember my face because we were many. <laughs> and I kept telling myself that time has come, time is moving very fast, but we keep having the same discussions over and over and over again. The one thing that I love about this Friday is that lawyers have come here with their guard down. Very few have suits. That is, a, that is a good milestone. I keep saying lawyers must shake it off, you know, shake it off a little bit so that you can leave. We are too serious. And that seriousness could be the reason as to why the train is stuck somewhere in Tanganyika, somewhere. It's not going around the whole of East Africa, isn't it? So ladies and gentlemen, allow me to adopt the salutations that were done by President Oundo 
because if I go through them, I can see my list here has about 20. It will take about three minutes of our time and allow me to delve into the crux of my discussion today. Um, <coughs> standing here today is indeed a great reflection of my younger years in the legal profession. Back then, I recall my services at the ELS in the delivery of the current Secretariat Council, besides serving as a council member, Secretary General, sorry, and Secretary General of ELS. For sure, I'm elated to be here today for us to reflect on the dream of a unified East Africa community, the role of lawyers and ESC partners. Let me begin by stating that ELS conference is a noble idea. In fact, we should give a round of applause to the organizers and all the presidents. <laughs> Plus, the thinkers and the pioneers of this noble uh, initiative. ESC for sure has now expanded. We gather here today well aware of the important milestone ESC has achieved, talk of the reduced market fragmentation, trade, liberalization, free movement of people, goods and services, all these are worth celebrating. However, this growth has not been without challenges to it, tedious and costly decisions, policy making processes, national sovereignty and lack of executive authority at ESC level, economic disparity at partner states level and lack of equitability mechanisms. The changing of global environment, resource constraints, financial challenges, and lack of awareness among East Africans on the integration process. It is at this point that we must begin to ask ourselves on the mechanisms that can help the region to integrate better and faster. Further, to interrogate whether the EAC treaty is ripe for amendment, as well as whether the EAC protocols are serving the integration agenda sufficiently. A question we must consider along the way is, of course, what is the place of the legal profession in fostering regional integration? Again, it is draining that over and over again, ESC integration has always informed our interactions. On the positive, I know this discussion is very important as we focus on a dream yet to be realized. It is my wish that in the spirit of professional collegiality, we shall combine efforts to actualize the ESC integration. In my own personal reflection, I have thought deeply how to, how for more than 20 years we are still stagnating. Yet the solution lies with us. The answer lies with us making strides so that we are able to gain new heights every day. It is a clarion call for professional collegiality. We need to embed the thinking that is well captured within the anthem of ESC. We should guard our community, we should be committed and stand strong. Our unity is our anchor, long live our community. We must believe in those words. This prayer made by our founding leaders speaks to us. It prompts us to identify, define and commit to taking actions from which everyone will win. Secondly to me, a united East Africa is where all partners, states, are mutually benefiting. This is the principle that we should keep in mind. We should ensure that integration promotes business connectivity. One area where I'm sure that we can benefit mutually is in respect of geographic and economic connectivity. That is a low-hanging fruit. For me, if you have to choose a single priority, connectivity is the most important. What does connectivity mean for ESC? It means trading amongst yourselves, leading to a boom in inter-regional in, in, in inter trade. Rwanda, for instance, can export easily within the region. So is Kenya and other the ESC uh, partner states. If we can aggregate what we offer to the world, we have more collective bargaining power. This becomes a win-win situation for all of us. Allow me to make the point that global integration and regional integration go together. They are not substitutes. Let me point out one way for better connectivity within the labor sector that will bring more quality 
within the labor, within the regional labor sector. To a large extent, we already have labor mobility, especially amongst unskilled workers. The problem is what is that we are hesitant to allow skilled workers, technocrats, professionals, educated entrepreneurs to cross borders for purposes of working and doing business. Perhaps we are, av we are afraid of inviting competition to our doorsteps, but I suggest that if we can extract the best out of each other in the most conducive country or environment, we will gain a collective competitive advantage within the global market. The ESC integration is not static. It's not a static idea frozen in time. It is an involving project that needs constant re-engineering. Every so often, we are called to reimagine it and adjust it to a higher ideal. Regional integration implementation gaps should be identified and addressed. We should enhance our advisory role to fast track the implementation strategies. We must issue advice in a way which fosters collaboration rather than competition. Similarly, we should champion for greater cooperation between organs of the community for more efficient implementation of laws, protocols, and programs of the ESC. I therefore call upon us to address the implementation challenges from a practical point of view. For example, in Kenya today, we have reduced the number of police stops for transit goods. Believe you me, it looks simple, but you have gained a lot of milestone in terms of how goods transit within the region. In order to ensure speedy movement of goods and services to ESC members countries, this has been a plus. We, also <coughs> we are also ensuring smoother operations at the way bridges. Let us also work towards the smooth operation of a single entry. Fourthly, the making of our ESC community is not a destination, it's a journey. Each lawyer must travel this journey. Every aspect of the integration agenda is ultimately expressed as law. Without relevant legal frameworks, noble ideals can never be turned into reality. We should play an oversight role by demanding progress reports on the various programs and projects within the community. Additionally, we should carry occasional on-spot site visits to these projects to validate the information provided in the progress reports. When we are vigilant in, practical, in a practical manner, we become the voice of our people. Let us shake it off drop the suits. Fifthly, as we work diligently on the technical aspect of integration, we must lose sight of the fact that economic opportunities create, create, we create must benefit more than just a few. Lawyers must be at the forefront of the fight against inequality. The development we foster in our time must be not just for some, but for all of us. It is my desire, and as a member of ELS, to see that the dream of a unified East Africa is realized without any impediment. It becomes important to also note that this dream should be carried with passion by professional women in the region. The region is big enough for all. Indeed, it is shocking to note that to date there is no protocol concerning women's issue, issues in particular. It is imperative to have protocols that mainstream women and girls' issues not just on socioeconomic development, but in relation to all spheres where women and girls and the youth are involved. To achieve this, we must speak in one voice on abolishing legislation, uh, discouraging customs that are discrimina discriminatory. We must speak in one voice on promoting effective education awareness programs aimed at changing negative attitudes. We must speak in one voice on how to create and adopt technology which will ensure the stability of employment and professional progress for all. And all of this starts with embracing dialogue and learning from other states that have achieved this aspiration to a large extent. I say this from a point of experience and interaction with uh, organizations whose priority areas have always gravitated towards economic empowerment within the region. In general, we need to face these challenges and fix them in order to become a stronger East Africa and, it times, and in times like this, when climate change is a threat, when hunger is ravaging our population, and when floods are causing havoc, we need a plan for integration that can help pull us together, not split us apart. We are each other's countrymen and women. We share these miraculous lands called East Africa. 
The East Africa and its heritage is yours and mine and everyone else, so long as they are willing to pledge allegiance and understand the solemn responsibility of ESC integration. Let us hold together in the face of our challenges, yes? Let us be more than allies to each other. Let us take on each other's struggles as our own. My philosophy in life is to build on the conviction that we are strong together, not separated in factions or sides, not shouting over each other, but together we can move forward. The ESC community is stronger when everyone contributes to it and everyone can benefit from the work they do. Our communities are stronger when we all pull together to solve our problems and restore our faith. Allow me to say, <coughs> coming together is a beginning. Keeping together is a progress. Working together is success. ESC is stronger when we work with friends and allies to promote peace, prosperity, security amongst member states. When all is said and done, raising awareness campaigns on ESC integration process across Africa will be something to be proud of. Ladies and gentlemen, I have spoken about the challenges facing e the integration of the East Africa and the need for us to play a role in realizing a unified ESC. I will not end without pursuing us to look into the history of East Africa establishment, always from a dream, always from the dream of our four leaders, as this will inform our actions henceforth. This is so because history is faithful, is a faithful compass to the future. As one man statesman said, the further backward we look, the further forward we are likely to see. Our past should not hold our progress. Our past should be the basis of our better future. Can I repeat that? The further backward we look, we are stuck in our history, isn't it? The further forward we are likely to see. Our past should not hold our progress. Our past should be the basis of a better future. I wish to reiterate that our region's process of integration should be citizen-centered and should also seek to foster the active participation of the people of East Africa. We must participate actively in advising our respective governments to give regional integration the seriousness it deserves. This means that some of the unfounded attitudes of superiority or fears of competition must be changed. Finally, we continue to allow DLS leadership in embracing inclusivity by bringing on board Young Lawyers Conference, the Women Lawyers Conference, and the in-house council conference, which were actually missing. All these groups bring brilliant ideas on the table. And thus, the words by J.C. Jackson, when everyone is included, everyone wins. With these remarks, I wish to encourage all of us to champion measures of a unified ESC, that we, that way we will remain the last best hope of earth. Thank you very much. Asanteni sana. So to my teachers, you can see what you build. To my mentees, uh, Mausud is one of them. I can't see the others. How many are you here, my mentees? Good, you can be better than me. Asanteni sana. Testing, testing. Okay. Uh, another round of applause to our speaker. Um, it, as, I, as I promised at the beginning of the session, uh, it was going to be a very loaded uh, keynote address. Um, key highlights uh, are that we have to work together, uh, working in a fragmented manner, 
cannot help us to make progress. We um, should not be uh, uh, held hostage by our past failures, but rather we should be working hard to overcome them. Uh, and in doing so, we should celebrate every progress we make, however modest. A case in point is what uh, has been done in Kenya around uh, trade facilitation. Uh, the imperatives of doing everything in an inclusive manner and ensuring that there is equality for everyone as well as a mutually, a mutually beneficial um, uh, East African project. Quite a lot to digest. As we um, try to take it in, I will ask two questions to our um, speaker before I open it up for, for uh, to the plenary. Uh, Honorable Chigai, uh, for the ESC projects to work, it is also important that, that the constitutive states must be strong and effective for them to contribute to this project. What do you see as the role of lawyers in first and foremost contributing to the building of effect effective states in their own countries? And maybe because the second question is tied to the first, what should we be doing first and foremost as individual lawyers what should what should we be doing as law firms for those of us that are grouped in law firms what should be the role of the national law societies and then what should we be doing together as ELS thank you All right, thank you very much. Um, also feel free to add to the pointers um, from the other side. So the first question, the ESC projects and what these countries can put together and the role of lawyers. I think the two questions, I'll try and answer both of them because they fit into each other. Um, it is important first for us to identify, once you identify where the problem is, you now start looking for solutions. In terms of infrastructural base, for me it is key for we as professionals to help these countries to put in place a physical and institutional infrastructure which can feed into the various projects that we have. I would almost fit in and say, for any institution to work best, you must have a plan. That plan in most institutions, they call it a strategic plan for certain deliverables. It's the same thing. If we put these institutions together and we agree within the next 15 years, this is what we want to achieve. I said we've been talking about regional integration for more than 20 years. The question is, within the discussions we've had for the last 20 years, what did we say we must achieve within the 20 years? What has been achieved? Where are the gaps and what is missing? Once we have a plan in place from an institutional point of view, an infrastructure point of view, then we can contribute to the final product. So we can say within the first year we achieved one out of five. So how do we achieve the four other elements? So for me, I think lawyers, we have a duty to our governments. In most cases, uh, we need to shape the institutional policies where we are, for those who are in within the private sector, the ones who are in public sector. We need to start noting or advocating for policies and ideologies that fit within the East Africa ideologies. So good steps have been made. Uh, we have the East Africa Community Protocol that we all signed. The question is, who is carrying the burden? Have we left the burden to the various ministries and we have packed our bags and left and we meet here 
every year to discuss about integration, party, have our AGM elect leaders and go back. Um, there's beauty when we take um, leadership and we also take account of what we keep discussing. So for me, that would be key that we have to build our institutional infrastructure and ensure that even at our individual level, we have ensured that we participate. We as lawyers, from an individual the president indicated we have very few Tanzanians to hold our hands and take us out there. So yesterday I took myself out there. <laughs> but that's where it starts, isn't it? Simple things that build to the bigger picture. How many friends do we have within the East Africa community? As young lawyers, six years ago, we started the East, I'm not a young lawyer anymore. We started the East Africa Young Lawyers Conference. It was turbulent. And within that conference, we, ha we call ourselves the East Africa Ambassadors. Within that family, we have so many leaders within our legal profession that have emanated from that pool of people. That, those are the small things that we need to do. Have your friends. When I need something in uh, Rwanda, I simply call P. Who is P? The current vice chair of uh, ELS. He's not in the room. But they, are, they were all part of the movement that brought the young people together. But that movement was actually to do good for the region. Most of them are now in different bars as leaders, and that is what we are talking about. So if that means we have to keep the wheel moving, either at individual level, but positively so. Let us shun the negative energy that brings our institutions back. So we need to build on that, keep building on that, keep building, and keep passing down the dreams of the integration. As old as we get, our energies also go low. So the older you are within the profession, ensure you mentor the others so that they keep moving the wheel so that it never stops. So that is at individual level. Within the legal profession, there's a lot we can do. There's a lot of research work that needs to go into this. There's a lot of research work that has been done which is sitting in shelves somewhere. We are not able to implement that. As lawyers, we need to shape the policies within our countries. We need to be able to move together we need to be able to advise our governments. We need to be able to do advocacy within that level and try and convince our governments that this is the right way to go. Uh, we've, talk, we've talked about the historical issues that keep taking us back. How then do we broom? We sweep the room. How do we sweep the room? We can only sweep the room clean, as big as it is, if all of us participate. So let us all take a broom and start sweeping. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. I'll now allow two questions um, from the audience. Uh, do we have a mic somewhere? Oh, we have to share this. Thank you very much. My name is uh, Ambassador Francis Butajira. And I was privileged to have led a team of technicians that negotiated the East African Treaty. And so I know how it started and the barriers. During the discussions, the overall there was suspicion on member states, suspicion that a developed state, a more developed state, will take advantage of the less ones. And that characterized the discussion, suspicions, suspicions. If you talked of free movement, of trade, of goods, then there's, you look at maybe goods from country A would swamp the goods from country B. Now, unfortunately, that suspicion is still in our zone. And that's why we have non-tariff barriers, despite free movement of goods, 
you have non-tariff barriers. Why? Why are they there? Now, I think the challenge of us as lawyers, first of all, let's internalize the provisions of the treaty, the protocol, understand them, see where we have not lived up to the practical part of it, and see what we can move. So the lawyers here can play an active role only if you have understood the, the relevant laws governing the establishment of the treaty. So that's a big challenge that we have to face. Then how do we move as lawyers in respective countries? A gathering like this is very useful. How do we organize in our countries seminars, workshops that are focused on East African integration? that we will look at the barriers and we will look at the solutions. That's another role the, the, the lawyers can play. Now, once again, some cases come up that they need interpretation of the treaty or implementation of the treaty. So the lawyers take it up actively and see what role you can play. Thank you very much. Good morning, my name is Claire Manya from Uganda. Uh, thank you for that wonderful presentation. I just wanted to ask you, in your opinion, is regional cooperation the same as regional integration? Yesterday the president talked about um, where we should start from. And she said that while we are here, probably everybody should make sure that uh, you get a business card from your counterpart, if you're from Uganda, get a business card from the counterpart in Kenya and Tanzania, and we start cooperating first. And then after we've tried it out, we can share how that experience is going with them, and then probably they can move to the next level of bringing Tanzania to the table. Well, that's how I understood it. Regional cooperation seems to appreciate the uniqueness of each country. For us to assume that we are all equal and so we shall all fit equally into the I, I think it's for us to be oblivious to the facts. Kenya, Uganda, and Tanzania are not on the same level at all. So somehow I understand what the previous speakers say to say that the suspicions. I don't really think they are suspicions. I think it's the facts that some people will feel. You cannot integrate with China, for example. They will swallow you up. So you have to safeguard yourself. And in the same way with East Africa, we are really not on the same level. So I ask again, in your opinion, is regional cooperation the same as regional integration? Thank you. Santa Sana. Uh, uh, we'll, we'll take some uh, uh, other questions. However, now uh, uh, the judge president of the ESCJ has to leave to the airport and wanted to say something before he travels. If we can allow him to say a few words before uh, we can conclude with our panel discussion. Members, sorry, we'll interrupt this session uh, because the judge president, as we've been informed, has to leave for the airport. I'll just share a very brief bio in one minute and then invite my Lord to come and share his thoughts with us. He is currently the president of the East African Court of Justice. He has a master's degree in international public law from Hope University Bujumbura and a postgraduate diploma in law mediation and arbitration from the Institute of Social Work, Da Tanzania. His previous experience includes being a director general of judicial organizations and principal state attorney of the Republic of Burundi. He has also served as principal legal advisor, office of the Minister of Justice and Attorney General Burundi, and has also been part of the experts on verification on the admission of the Republic of South Sudan to the East African community. My Lord, I would like to invite you to come and address the members of the East African Law Society. Thank you. Thank you very much, my brother. 
a lot of protocols observed. First of all, I wish to, to thank the, the Eastern Royal Society for this invitation. You know, our court has uh, we have been in Uganda from 23rd of, 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 of October, and we'll be there for, tw for, 40, for 40 days. So we, we, we decided since last year that our court will be moving in partner in, in November. So last year we spent 30 days in Ujumura, and uh, this year in November, October, November, we are in Uganda. So next year maybe in, in, in Rwanda, and we decided to, to move the court. Because when I, I, I assumed, when I was appointed the, the judge of the court, and also the, the pay of this court, I decided to be guided, guided by the three guiding principles for my seven years tenure. One principle being the teamwork, the second one being good faith, and the last one being judicial diplomacy. And we say that the court cannot perform if it, is, it is just sits here in Arusha. It must go around. Normally, the law of the, of, of the East Africa law society is key in implementing the agenda of the community. As my brother and ambassador says, very rightly, you cannot contribute very seriously if you don't know the, the, law, the law of the community, the treaty, the protocols, the annexures, and the, the whole law of the community. So we, in our court, our East African Court of Justice, we know that the, the East African Society has contributed in its jurisprudence. Because before I was appointed, I, I came from the bar to the bench. I've been, I've been practicing for 10 years, 12 years in the Eastern Court of Justice. I know that you, the lawyers, the Eastern Court of Society, has contributed too much in, in, in uh, enriching the jurisprudence of the court. But uh, it was surprising when we met with the Tangaika Law Society, Arusha chapter. Some of the lawyers don't, don't even understand this court. Uh, they are here in Arusha. So if you ask them about the judicial of the court, access to the court, most of them they don't know. So I think it's better, as the Eastern Society, to train the lawyers on the law of the court in implement the, the agenda of the community. In Uganda, there was a minister who said that uh, we have to be careful because this court can be interf interfering with the sovereignty of the partner states. But how can, you, how can you say the court will intervene, will interfere with the sovereignty of the, of, of the states? Instead of cleaning your house, implementing the, 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 the law of the community, because the truth is clear. The truth is clear. The, principle, the principles and Article 60D and 72 on uh, good governance, including the, the rule of law, social justice, gender equality, accepted standards of human rights, which shall govern the achievements of the objectives of the community by the patronizes. So the court, we have, now we are, we are in Uganda, we are deciding cases from all the patronizes. And we, are, we don't fear whenever we are inter we interpreting the, any provisions of the treaty, including Article 60D, relating to human rights. So what I can assure you, my brothers and sisters, the lawyers, the academicians, the judges, I can see my sister judge from the Supreme Court of Burundi, without the people of East Africa, knowing the treaty and the laws of, com of the community, you will not really contribute cleanly in also in implementing the agenda of the community. This kind of, of, of conference is ve are very important, at least because they bring all the lawyers from all the, all the partner states. Last time when we decided the case from Kenya on, on, uh, on, uh, on uh, uh, Martha, Martha Karua case, when we hear the, the, the government lawyers coming from the partner states, they say, no, you know, this matter has, has been decided from the Superior Court of Kenya. Why are we interfering with the judicial from Kenya, from the partner says? But uh, for us, we are not an appellate court. But when we, when we look at the, the judgment from the partner says, we put them on the balance and they see their compliance with the, their international obligations. The matter coming from Burundi, even from the Supreme Court, from the Constitutional Court, where we tell them, you, you see, uh, you know, we are interfering with, the, with our sovereignty. What sovereignty are you referring to? You must, we are saying, my brother and sister from East African society, Train your lawyers. Train your lawyers. 
a trade warriors. Asante Nisan. My Lord, um, as I said in the beginning, we are not surprised by your short, candid remarks. Uh, you are always uh, hard hitting, straight to the point, and, 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 and that's it. So we thank you. We will take up the message. We have, I think, uh, done advocacy for the courts. We have held some training sessions actually in Arusha in the past one year. Um, and also gone through South Sudan, uh, Uganda, Tanzania, all the member states. So we'll continue to do that training so that people can appreciate the importance of the courts. I will hand over the session back to the moderator so we can be able to conclude as we escort Judge President out. Thank you. I uh, think the judge president leaves us on a very good note. If you are going to be a relevant player in realizing the East African project, at least understand the law, the treaty, its provisions, as well as the annexures. I think it might be more efficient to allow the speaker to first answer the first two questions. I had seen several other hands, so we could pay, let her first answer the first two questions, and then we can add uh, uh, another question. Or, do, or would you rather take them all at the same time? You want to answer the first two? Okay, thanks. All right, thank you very much. First, the beauty about the questions asked is that the answers are already given. Um, on the issue of gaps, I think we had gone through that, and there's a lot that we need to look at when it comes to the gaps. First, we have our domestic laws that some of them need to be appealed for us to be able to move together. Our national policies need to be looked at. The geographic terrain is also different in terms of the business entities and then the inefficiency in terms of policies. So that is a good way to look at it. So we have to find those gaps and then see how to address them within our various uh, countries before now we put our heads together. The second question was the issue of cooperation vis-a-vis -vis integration. And you actually answered it. You cannot have integration without cooperation. When you read the ESC uh, uh, protocol, you realize that there are certain uh, um, areas where we need to cooperate that leads to integration. So you cannot speak of integration without cooperation. So maybe the question that was still left lingering was the question of suspicion. This question is the same question I asked. Do we need to cling to our past? that blocks us from moving forward, or do we need to learn from our past experiences, identify the gaps, and allow ourselves to grow? Again, for those who are in business, including our lives is a risk, isn't it? We normally say our lives are risks. The time we wake up in the morning, it's even a risk to go to bed, because you don't know whether you'll wake up the next day. So do we want to take a risk, a calculated risk, and allow, and allow the region to breathe and grow? Or do we want to continue sleeping with the historical past that keeps blocking us from moving forward? Now, how do we kill this suspicion that keeps lingering around? Let's start by being friends, which we're already doing, isn't it? 
after we become friends and we get to understand each other and each other's dreams, vision, plans, then we can agree to work together, isn't it? So for me, really, let us not make this suspicion, continue lingering in our rooms to an extent that even when our grandchildren are born and they're here, they will still be talking about suspicion within East Africa community. We need to move, and we can only move if we take calculated risks. We can only move if we agree that we want to move. We can also move if we agree that we can do the risk analysis. That's the work of lawyers. Why don't we do SWOT analysis within our regions and risk analysis and tell ourselves this is a small risk, we can try. We can try. This is a big risk, let us try and mitigate the risk, then we take the risk. That is how business is done, isn't it? So for me, I remember when we joined the society, when I, I came here for the first uh, ELS conference during Donald Dare's time, I don't think, I've not seen him in the room, but I've seen him around. We still had the same discussion. I was a young lawyer then. I'm not a young lawyer now. So that is my worry, that we keep talking about the same things, we keep asking ourselves the same question, and we are stuck. So the question then is, what next? The answer is with you. Thank you very much. I had seen uh, uh, the Executive Director of the East African Business Council. Please pass him the mic. And then um, there's uh, another hand there. Uh, good morning. Yeah, allow me first of all to uh, appreciate uh, my brother, the current um, uh, president of the uh, East African Law Society, and also uh, appreciate the, the, the presenter uh, for the good presentation. Um, I have uh, two questions. One is the, is the treaty and uh, it is part of your remarks, and also the protocol. Um, I've been wondering if the treaty was properly crafted, and the protocol uh, enshrined within the treaty. Uh, when we looked at the treaty, there are important principles uh, that govern the treaty, people-centered integration and market-driven integration. Uh, but when you look at the, the process the ESC has been undertaking, integration, it has been um, what we call really a level of integration, counting the stages of integration, but not consolidating the gains emanating from each stage. Customs union, common market. Uh, then we are moving towards monetary union. We are also going to political federation. But as um, the legal pr practitioners, I thought there is some, a bit of work that is required in terms of um, understanding the treaty, understanding the protocols, understanding the annexes, and look at the, the gaps and the nuances or ambiguity within the, the instruments. The reason why I'm saying that, and uh, it has a very strong justification that when you look at the intra-regional trade, the situation is alarming. Currently, we are talking about 18% of our trade amongst ourselves. Other countries, other regions are talking about 60%. So there's a lot of work that we need to do. The integration is not serving the people, it is not serving the business community. The moderator mentioned about uh, the barriers. And we always, uh, and I want to thank the current president that now, uh, the legal society, we are working together with the ABC, at least to interpret some of the protocols, to, to guide the trade, to guide the business community, because we are very stuck. We are very stuck in terms of the instruments. Let me just give two important instruments that are very critical that you need to reflect on. One, under the Customs Union, there is what we call Trade Remedies Committee. It is now 17 years down the road that the committee hasn't functioned. And that is the instrument that would guide and resolve some of the emerging conflicts. Two, there has been an effort to have an MTB Act. It was uh, enacted in 2015. It was reviewed our gaps, 
It was reviewed since 2017. Six years down the road, it is still under legal scrubbing. It is still under legal scrubbing. Do we have a sense of urgency in terms of integration? Lastly, I realized that we used to have a good tool called the uh, Common Market Scorecard. Yesterday I was with uh, the, the current minister of ESC from the Republic of Kenya. That Common, uh, common Market Scorecard was a good instrument to look at the legal and regulatory compliance, what we call legal audit and regulatory compliance. Where are we in terms of law? Uh, looking at the national laws, vis-a-vis -vis regional laws, what is the convergence, what are the divergence, and we could assess which country is doing that. But the problem was that that tool was funded by World Bank. Uh, then when World Bank was drawn, then it ceased to exist. So the common market currently is stuck. We are stuck. We, in economics, we call it being economic quagmire. You cannot move forward. You are in mud. You cannot move forward. You cannot move backward. You are stuck. So when I be minister, those are uh, some of the few pointers that uh, maybe I need you to, as a minister, as someone who has been in the, in the legal profession, to guide, to guide us in terms of what can be done within the treaty, what can be done within the protocol. Do we have an enforcement mechanism to ensure that those good tools uh, can be implemented? Thank you very much. Uh, please. So uh, one final question here. Give her the mic. <laughs> okay. It was supposed to be here. Good morning, everyone. Um, I think my name is more of a comment. I want to say, uh, yesterday I said that we've taken quite a stride, and I still appreciate that. I appreciate all the speakers, I want to say that uh, from, from uh, what my predecessors have said, we've had uh, East African Parliament, we have the East African Law Society, we have a joint army, we have, I think we've, gone, we've progressed very well. And I want, I want us to appreciate the fact that we have different, we have different levels in our economies, different GDPs, but what we have in common, and what we should, what we should uh, labor to protect, and what will lead us to go forward, is the fact that we need that common market. The common market, we must appreciate that the world being a global economy, our populations in individual states are quite small. We all need each other. We need the joint trade. And for us to have that, we need a joint head. Uh, leadership is all concentrated in their own individual states, and that's why I suggested that we actually need uh, a president, preferably a retired one from their own individual states, so that they, they spearhead this cooperation, so that the policies are actually implemented, so that the treaties are implemented, so that there's a sense of um, there's a sense of urgency to make sure we, we complete what we start. But if we sit and our South African Parliament sits and passes, you know, laws, and these laws go back to individual states, we are able to move forward to protect this trade market. But as the global economies are growing, we still need to get back. We need to market right now. Um, uh, got involved in business of exporting. We go, we get fruits from Kenya. Kenya will get also our produce. We will package and sell. We are actually cooperating. The business people are cooperating, but we are not benefiting because we do not have a common tax basket. We do not have a common currency. But every way we, uh, we 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 gain individually. We grow our GDPs individually, and that's good enough. If we have leadership on top, put we have a court in place, I think we will really move forward. I thank you. Thank you, everyone, for your questions. I see there are so many hands, but let me uh, assure you that this is a continuing discussion. Uh, the theme, the discussions around the theme will continue. 
And so uh, your questions will be answered as we go along. Let me allow uh, Honorable Chigai to respond to this too. And then uh, this specific part of the discussion will end there. Over to you. Okay, thank you very much. Again, there are more comments than questions. In fact, you contributed immensely to the discussions that are going on. So it's a plus to you, so we can clap for you. You know, when you were actually speaking, I saw quite a number of consultancy work. As lawyers, those gaps need to be addressed, but they can only addre be addressed if we take the lead. Uh, within the protocol, there was established the East African institutions where various uh, uh, countries now have either a ministry leading the ESC agenda or in some countries I've seen they have an agency within a ministry that is leading the ESC agenda. So the question then is what are the key deliverables within those ministries that need to address the gaps currently at ESC level? And remember, when I started talking, I said the various gaps that you are currently experiencing are the reason as to why we are cooperating well, but we have not reached the integration threshold that we wish to be. And she has answered. She said the issue of common market is a big problem right now, and it's that's the simplicity of that is one currency. And there are also challenges towards that. How are we going to open the common market, the trade protocols that have been signed? The ESC protocol clearly put in place the committee, but has it been actualized? The plus I would give all the ESC countries is that they have established a ministry within their governments that is now addressing the ESC issues. And that is where the laws, the policies uh, needs to be addressed fully. And uh, within these specific countries, as lawyers, those are gaps, those are consultancy uh, entities that you need to tap into. So it's business for you and at the same time helping your countries. So for me I see huge opportunities that you need to tap into. We also need to be alive to the fact that regional integration has winners and losers. You will win and you lose something. So it's how we balance and agree that at the end game, we are all winning, and the threshold of winning is higher than losing. And I think within the global market, it's a huge win if the ESC speaks with one voice. Part of the challenges we have is geography, sovereignty of the different states, uh, the, the history, how we do our politics, uh, trade infrastructure, you know, the investment flows that we currently have both within our local environment, regionally and internationally. For instance, there are protocols signed where you find there are certain countries, because of our GDP within ourselves, there are certain countries which can import you know, the security industry. There are some which can import um, the security um, gears and there are some which cannot. And that is highly dependent on how we are viewed within the global market. So some of these things can be leveraged if you team together you can import as a team, you know. So common market is very important, but it is one area that we are still lagging behind. So allow me not to deliver much in that because she had already uh, expounded on it. But bottom line, we just need to take the risk together. Thank you. Uh, thank you so, so much for this uh, very interesting discussion. Uh, like I said, uh, the discussion continues uh, on this theme, and uh, you'll be hearing from other speakers. And so uh, I'd like to uh, put this to a close. Once again, another round of applause for our speaker. Uh, friends, we can do better than that. I think Honorable uh, Harriet has done justice to this topic. But many of us still had questions. Now, the next panel is going to sort all our questions out. There was a complaint from the team behind. I have put someone with the mic behind. We are going to have our questions uh, answered. Thank you very much, Past President Richard, uh, Cabinet Secretary, Honorable Harriet Chigai. Thank you very, very much for this uh, session. Our second session is going to be moderated by President Bernard Orondo. But before he does that, friends, 
someone has misplaced their car key, it has a caleb on it, please ensure you have evidence it's your car. You might go with a Toyota key to go and open a Mercedes Benz, you'll be arrested. President Bernard over to you for our next session and uh, friends, as we ask these questions, let us keep them short for other people to also get an opportunity to ask. Over to uh, President Bernard. Because of the time, um, I'm going to ask our panelists to come. I'll introduce them as I introduce them. I was asked to ask, I was asked to moderate this session, I think, probably because of the passion I have for ESC integration. Um, and most of the people we have invited are key players in this uh, ESC integration. So allow me, members, invite Honorable Josephine Lemoyan, Member of Parliament, East African Legislative Assembly. Is she here? Oh, thank you. Please come. Mr. John Bosco Kalisa, Executive Director, EABC. Honorable Dr. Kalusi Kalumia, Honorable Consul, Consulate of Malawi, and Senior Partner of Kampala Associated Advocates. Please, please come. Can we welcome them with the... Uh, Mr. Tom Onyango, Senior Partner, Triple OK Law. <laughs> Mr. Huntington Namara, Managing Director, Equity Bank Rwanda. So as the past president said, as he was moderating the session, most of the questions, uh, we will take them during this panel. And so I will give, as I introduce them and as they speak, each of them has been given a, a topic to speak to. And then we will have uh, most of the questions answered during this session. I will start with Honorable Josephine Lemoyan, Member of Parliament, East African Legislative Assembly. She was born in Singida, Tanzania. She's a cross-sector expert for applied social research, policy analysis, with preference in using accountability and governance diagnostic tools in water resource and natural resource management. She was elected to be one of the two Tanzanian representatives in the Iliala Commission. She served for five as a member of agriculture and then two and a half years respectively as the Regional Affairs and Legal Committee. She continues to work as a part-time resource person and consultant and facilitates action research initiatives and community-based voluntary activities. She has two children. Um, Honorable, I'll, I'll, I'll be introducing them as they, as they come to speak. So Honorable, we would like you to just focus on the role of the legislator and just basically the geopolitics around unifying a community from the eyes of someone who has participated in legislative making. Earlier, before we had issues around suspicion um, around member countries, you as a person who has participated in legislative make making, how do these affect the integration process? Welcome. Good morning, or oh, is it afternoon? I think it's still morning. Uh, I'm not sure how to do the salutation properly, so I'm going to say all protocols observed. But uh, I appreciate very much to be invited to come and speak to you, uh, learned brothers, sisters, 
Uh, is that the right way of saying it? I'm not sure. But I'm very, very happy. I'm humbled. I'm totally afraid that I'm going to make many mistakes. But uh, uh, I'm also confident because I'm a teacher. Mimi ni mwalimu. So, because I normally teach from the small children to the young people, women and the elderly, my confidence is there and I hope I'll be able to engage with you effectively and uh, I'll try to be as efficient as possible. I have only 10 minutes, I think. Okay, so I'll try to stick the 10 minutes. My presentation, when I was preparing it, I was completely, completely uh, disoriented because I knew that I'm coming to speak to you as experts of, in lawmaking while I participated in that process of making laws in East African community while I was not an expert. But I knew that I could make a, a contribution from uh, my diversity. So that is what gave me confidence to accept the invitation to come here. So uh, briefly, we know that this is, this is a project. East African community is an intergovernmental project. We know that. And we know it is people-centered. They have heard other speakers talking about it, about people-centeredness, market orientation, and so on and so forth. So I'm not going to go into that. But I want us to bear in mind that the community seriously is trying through a number of engagements with experts like yourselves and others, civil society, East African Business Council. They are busy trying to develop policies, programs, uh, in many, many areas of cooperation, we, we heard about cooperation, in matters concerning politics, economy, social, cultural fields, and so on and so forth. Yeah? And we, we, we expect, after we complete the journey through those four stages, eventually we are going to have one East Africa. And uh, maybe uh, down the line, we are going to be one Africa through the the, 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 the initiative that we've started just recently. Now, I'm going to be a bit formal and a little bit informal because uh, when, I f when, when we stick, and that is my feeling, when we stick only to the formal, the laws, the processes, the protocols, the blah, blah, yeah, we lose sight of the informal, the reality on the ground, that's why we have these issues of suspicion. We are suspicious. But what is this suspicion all about? What is this fear of the unknown that we have within ourselves? I believe that uh, the suspicion that we have when it comes to matters of relinquishing power is something that uh, actually is an impediment in the integration process. But that too can be discussed. Now, after completion of the for pillars, I said, we might uh, be encountering a number of uh, diversities. We have seven members of, of, of East African uh, community now as partner states. Yeah? Our region eh, has grown. It is a cost-to-cost -cost regional economic block. So when it comes to issues of geopolitics, we start looking at the geopolitics of Indian Ocean and that of Atlantic Ocean. Huh? Eh? What are we doing there? What is happening? Who are the actors? Who are the factors? What are the laws? What are regulations? How are the people eh, benefiting and engaging with uh, this reality that now we are moving from Indian Ocean to Atlantic? We have a population, more than 300 people now that the RSC is in the picture. But are we able to unpack the 300 million? Who are, who are these people? Businessmen, businesswomen, urban dwellers, youths, women, do we discuss these issues as legislators, as we, sp as we sit in, uh, in our seats in East African community, and myself in the five years that I've sat in Eala? Do I know what is happening to the young people and what opportunities are there when we have this diversity that is brought about by the seven countries which are members of East African community? So East African community, now we are becoming very, very popular 
geopolitically because of the vastness of the area, but because of all the resources that we bring together. For example, yeah, if we start with the former three member states, URT, Republic of Kenya, Republic of Uganda, yeah, what uniqueness are brought about to the table, what opportunities are brought to the table that we can tap on and make sure that we benefit and we ensure that integration takes place. Rwanda and Burundi comes in 2007, Francophone. What did they do? Yeah? Now, I sit with my colleagues eh, in the office. They don't th speak French. They have tried as much as possible to start speaking English and Kiswahili. And I see the richness of uh, discussion, engagements that we have with people from Burundi and Rwanda. Later on, we see Republic of South Sudan. It's coming with all the conflicts eh, in their country, all the challenges, including the challenges of, uh, of remittances to the East African community coffers, and so on and so forth. But with those diversities, what is it that we can, we can, we can learn and what is it that we can take on board to benefit East African community? And now we have the RSC. It's coming on board, and immediately we see forces being taken to just making uh, troops being taken to, to DRC to help eh, uh, manage the conflicts there. So the diversities are there. And these are geopolitical issues that we might want to look into. But insofar as issues of uh, diversity and multi-dimensional factors that are, that are, that are influencing uh, our integration is concerned, I think we need to look seriously critically, and you can help us, you are lawyers, you know how to interpret uh, laws, you can put things in place, we have to look at uh, issues of formal and informal politics in, uh, in our political systems, in our countries. What is happening there? I mean, this is a political project. What is it that is happening in the politics in, uh, in our countries? What is it that we can do and help us to integrate uh, the, the region as much as we want to do? What are the internal factors and external ones? Who are the actors who come to play nowadays as these seven countries are coming together? We have China eh, as a major player nowadays in when it comes to issues of infrastructure across all East African countries, but when it comes to issues of uh, uh, extractive uh, 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 resources in all seven countries, and in particular, uh, the DRC. Uh, I want also to, to, to look at the uh, issues of um, uh, uh, electoral processes, emergence of media pluralism in all our countries, but more importantly, when it comes to young people, the growing use of IT and ICT uh, in our integration process. Well, how can we make use of uh, IT and I ICT and new spaces that are created through the use of uh, Tehama in, in, in our countries. Nowadays, most of the trade is done, is done through IT and ICTs. My, my mother, who wants, who benefits from uh, the, 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 this process of integration as a cross-border uh, trader, cannot use a handphone. A, hand, a handset, the, 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 the new one, the Pangusa Pangusa one, yeah? She cannot use it, but what is it that we can do that she can be helped together with many others who are there uh, in order to uh, make a, a, a good use of the opportunities available to us through East African cooperation. Now, we have other issues which we want to look at the influence, the geopolitics of our integration, such as issues as uh, environmental issues, uh, issues of COVID. COVID has affected us very much. And what is it that we have done in responding to COVID? What new regulatory frames do we need to put in place, which are friendly and useful to our people and help them to, uh, to benefit from uh, the objectives of, uh, of, uh, of, of, of this integration? Somebody talked about uh, the different uh, diversities in economic positions. Of course, today we have two middle income countries. One is Kenya and another one is Tanzania. And I put Tanzania in red because uh, I read somewhere that Tanzania is still an LDC. But uh, another argument is that Tanzania is in the middle income category. But that is subject to discussion and I don't want to go into that. 
But we have other countries which are Burundi, Rwanda, South Sudan, and Uganda. They come in as an LDCs. Not only that, a number of our countries are overlapping, uh, are members of other regional economic blocks. Tanzania is a member of two regional economic blocks, but others are in two or three regional economic blocks. What does it mean? What is the implication when it comes to geopolitics of integration? Uh, now, sitting in our seat as members of parliament, you know how many days we have a year? 56. So we have 56 days a year to sit in the committees and to sit in the plenary uh, sessions. So with 56 days, we are supposed to be deliberating, to discuss, to reflect, to bring uh, experts eh, who are going to help us to come up with regulatory frames to help the integration process. I think uh, when it comes to treaty, we need to do something about that because I don't think that is adequate time for people to seriously look at uh, integration for a, uh, for a region as big as, as, uh, as uh, East Africa. Uh, another thing which I thought I should bring to this presentation is about good news. Uh, according to the formal eh, side of things, when it comes to integration, there is a s something equivalent to a scorecard. And the uh, African Union is uh, using a an integration uh, scorecard. It's called Africa Regional Integration Index. And it is, uh, they have just published in two uh, 2019, they published uh, um, the outcomes of their, their analysis. And East African community ranked highly against all other seven uh, uh, regional economic blocks when it comes to uh, the level of integration. The, the indicators uh, such as the free movement of people, infrastructure integration, macroeconomic in integration, productive integration, and trade integration. East African, of course, is the highest. They have the index of uh, 0 0.5 and so on and so forth, and the least integrated, and I was surprised, is SADC. Uh, that is the good news, and I think uh, I wanted to, 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 to bring the, news, uh, the good news at the end so that you, the feeling of despair that we are not doing enough insofar as integration is concerned can, can be at least washed away to some extent. Um, when it comes to issues of formalities and informalities, uh, as members of parliament, how many minutes do I have? Two, three? Three. As members of parliament in the fourth uh, assembly, we had done as much as we could to open one important uh, door, and it's the door to the people. Because our, our, our community, one of the pillars of, community, of, of integration is about people-centeredness, we said, let's go out and see what are people saying about East African community. Formerly, a lot of uh, of citizens of East Africa, they say they don't know anything about integration. Informally, there are so many processes of integration that are taking place. People are getting married across the, 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 the borders. People are trading using formal and informal routes. Uh, there are political processes going on uh, across the, the border. Uh, and I, I, I realize that uh, we actually forget to tap on the, the non-official side of things, and we, stri we strict ourselves to the official uh, side of integration. And I think by doing that, we lose a lot of uh, track. Uh, just recently, uh, we had uh, a meeting of young parliamentarians. It's an informal uh, structure of East African community. And they told us what they are doing to make sure that the word of integration is shared across the, the youth in East Africa. What can you do? Legal language is difficult. People who are using the documents from our offices and the partner states offices, they get lost in the, in the legal jargon. And that is very, very, very difficult. Uh, 
We have a lot of institutions that we can work with. I'm very grateful to be working with East African Law Society because uh, they at least try to help us to unpack some of the, the legal issues that we cannot understand. I think you have a big role to play either as mentors, coach, or trainers of other institutions on matters concerning East African community integration. But not only that, that uh, role can cascade down to such institutions as paralegal institutions in our countries and making uh, the issue of East African integration a cross-cutting issue in all your activities. Thank you very much and uh, forgive me for being so informal. <laughs> And I'm very grateful for, for this uh, space. My name again is Josephine Lemoyan. Don't call me honorable. I wrote a thesis against all honorables who are, uh, are elected or selected to occupy uh, positions uh, like mine because we have a tendency to stick to the formal and forget the informal where we are coming from. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Honorable Member of Parliament. I think you've raised Mualimu and Mualimu. I think you've raised uh, so many important points. One of them is what, you, what uniqueness should is brought to the table. What opportunities do we have? Uh, we also need to reflect on the need to look at the time that legislators spend at the ESC Parliament, which is 56 days in a year. These are things we need to reflect on. But while that is said, we must also understand that the African Union Regional Integration Index reflects us as doing well um, before a number of other, other centers. And more importantly, being people-centered, uh, which is very key. So we now move to the business case for a unified East African community. Do we really need an East African community? And to discuss this is Mr. John Bosco Kalisa, who is the Executive Director of the East African Business Council. He's an economist by profession. He has an in-depth understanding of regional economic communities. He has experience in private sector development and competitiveness. And he has previously served as the country director of South Sudan for Trademark East Africa. He has also worked with the Rwanda Private Sector Federation. Please welcome with me Mr. John Bosco Kalisa. First of all, allow me to uh, thank and appreciate the organizer, uh, the East African Law Society, uh, the sponsors of this uh, excellent event, all the sponsors. I've seen a number of uh, companies and a number of EABC members uh, that have sponsored this event. Again, uh, I congratulate my brother Bernard Oundu uh, for bringing uh, this conference to Arusha. Uh, I think um, uh, the delegates who are here, um, you will really appreciate the, uh, the hospitality of this place, uh, of this uh, uh, region. Uh, I came yesterday from Nairobi and I came with a number of the delegates from uh, different uh, partner states. Uh, by the virtue of uh, having this conference after the COVID, uh, it really demonstrates the commitment in terms of the integration and the law of the legal fraternity in terms of deepening the integration. Um, the, the member of parliament who have, uh, who have just uh, uh, delivered her remarks, um, uh, she ended uh, her remarks with uh, uh, good news, but myself, uh, I want to start with good news. Uh, with good news, 
uh, based on the facts. Uh, again, yesterday I was uh, in, uh, in Kenya, I was meeting the, the new member of IELA and the Minister for ESC Affairs. Uh, when we were discussing about uh, uh, common market protocol, and I've been pushing for the movement of professional services. And I was made to understand that economists were not professionals. <laughs> we, we, are, we, we are included in under the other, other uh, services. The lawyers, the doctors, the architectures, they are the one considered under the professional services. So I think um, uh, it speaks loud why we have this uh, event and the law you need to pray uh, as uh, the, uh, the legal professionals in terms of deepening the integration agenda. So I said I'm, I'm going to uh, give my remarks, I have 10 minutes uh, to uh, provide good news, but also highlight some of the challenges uh, of the integration. As I mentioned here in a, when I was asking the the previous presenter, the treaty is very clear. People-centered integration and market-driven integration. As EABC, we are the voice of the private sector. We speak on behalf of the private sector. Uh, we address and take a keen look into how integration is market-driven. So when we talk about market driven, we're talking about prosperity, growing prosperity in our region. And again, before COVID, the first, fastest growing economies in the world were coming from ESC. Who would guess the three from ESC before COVID, 2019? These are numbers, statistics you can read, World Bank, uh, African Development Bank. Rwanda was the number one. Uh, followed by the United Republic of Tanzania, uh, then Kenya. Then when COVID hit this region around Ma March 2020, the World Bank uh, uh, published a report that uh, the Africa is going to slide into a recession after 25 years. Do you know the region that did not slide into recession or other regions Lakes that are recognized, there are eight lakes recognized by African Union. The only region that did not slide into recession was East Africa. And there are fundamental principles that why EAC, again read the report by African Development Bank, 2021. What was the magic bullet by EAC not sliding into recession? There were three important factors why ESC did not slide into recession. One, our close trade ties who were more integrated. And that sp speaks to political goodwill. Our leaders were committed. They were leaders, despite all the differences you are see, they, they could hold monthly meeting to allow goods, essential goods, to move across borders. Our borders were not closed. They were closed for people, but for goods were moving essential goods were moving. So we are able to save lives and livelihood of our people. I think we need to applaud our heads of state. <laughs> the second important factor was infrastructure investment. Infrastructure is essential for the growth, for the prospect of our region. Um, from Kenya, if you can see the, the quality of infrastructure, you are here in the United Republic of Tanzania, uh, you go to Rwanda, I'm from Burundi, all our heads of state are investing in infrastructure. Public infrastructures, schools, health facilities. That was uh, number two. Number three was our, the agriculture. The agriculture was one of our savior, one of the sectors that saved us, we were able to feed our citizen. So those are very fundamental uh, 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 factors that we need to reflect on. Whatever we are doing as a region, even with the current, with the current crisis, with even the current crisis, again, recent, uh, the, the, uh, this uh, last month, African Development Bank has uh, 
produced what we call uh, economic outlook of East Africa or our economic outlook of Africa, but still the most performing countries are coming from East Africa. Rwanda is registering a double digit growth of 10.9 percent, followed by Kenya by, uh, with 6.7 percent. This year, despite all these challenges of Russia, Ukraine, but our region is able to weather the storms, external storms, because of our instruments, because of our engagement into regional integration. And one of the fundamentals that we tend to negate or neglect is our youthful population, our young people. I realized in dealing with that report, they are saying the East Africa, 60%, why? 60% of our youth are very dynamic, they are buying, they are the, the consumers. So that is an asset that we've not exploited. So I think these are some of the uh, important instruments we need to always reflect on and see what are we doing, what are the magic bread, why our region, uh, why we, our leaders are emphasized, despite the challenges that are happening, conflict and uh, uh, other issues that were highlighted, but again, among the eight, among the eight lakes recognized by African Union, ESC is still the most performing regional economic communities. Among eight lakes are, are recognized by African Union, and my sister here has mentioned about the regional integration index, which also speaks about how, because they are looking at the productive integration, they are looking at the trade integration, monetary integration. ESC still scores higher than other lakes. So I think we need to applaud ourselves that integration is working despite the challenges. We can do much better, we can double that. I think, um, again, from the business perspective, again, we, EABC, uh, the recent, uh, the Deloitte did a study, what are the important factors for you to invest in a region? One is, of course, Number one was political stability. Number two, conducive business environment. Still, ES is still very attractive in terms of doing business. Any business you can do uh, because of dynamic market. We are talking, uh, we are talking now a population of around 300 million people with combined GDP, gross domestic product, of around 300 billion US dollars. So as we move towards continental free trade area, again, another good news is that out of 54 that signed the agreement, African continental free trade area, out of 54 that signed the agreement, 44 have already ratified the agreement. You are lawyer, you know what means by ratification. So that demonstrates more than 80 percent, demonstrates the commitment, political will that we need to integrate. But good news that out of uh, that, 44 out of the 44, recently there is what they called guided trade initiative, testing the water. Out of seven countries that were selected to start trading under CFTA, three came from East Africa, Rwanda, Kenya, United Republic of Tanzania, again. Out of seven, three came from from East Africa. So that demonstrates that there's that kind of political will, there is commitment by the business community uh, to do business within the region. And that is a huge market again. We are talking about 1.3 billion population. We are talking about GDP of around 3.4 trillion US dollars. The good thing that uh, with the with uh, the continental free trade area is that it is anchored under RICS. It is anchored under RICS. There is uh, a principle, those uh, maybe who speak uh, French, there's a principle called a key principle. Uh, and the, the, uh, the CFT is also takes that into consideration, the a key, preservation of a key principle. A key means that what has been agreed should not be disorganized should not be dismantled. We should build on what has been agreed. So the ESC is becoming a, a kind of a learning, a learning block. Other, bl other blocks are coming to run from ESC. Again, even the tariff offer, we've already made the threshold in terms of tariff offer. 
that, that is very, very critical. Another aspect that maybe uh, which we need also to reflect on is the principle of variable geometry. The lawyers need to interpret it very well, uh, which states that those who are ready should move. But also there is a, there is a certain caveat that how we, are, we, we move by consensus. How does the variable ge geometry happen when there is a consensus building? and when we wa want to move as a block. So I think that is uh, something that we need to, to reflect on. So I think uh, given the interest of the time, again I highlighted that um, ESC principles are very The second aspect that is very important when we implement the customs union and the common market has been the issue of um, non-tariff barriers at the borders. Again, this, become, this, this has been issues related to what I call asymmet asymmetric uh, uh, implementation. The issues, some, some, some states feel that they are not benefiting enough. Others are benefiting. So we, we, we create a kind of protectionism. Generally, when we our advocacy agenda, the ABC, we should open our borders. The ESC should be borderless borderless environment for trade and investment, especially for goods and services produced within the ESC. We need just to maintain borders for security purposes, but not to verify goods. And those goods, we've been advocating that those goods produced within the region, and we are going, uh, again, I'm, I'm happy my brother, we, we have initiated a discussion that we are going to have um, an office in all the borders, just to, to, to verify and see that the borders are not avenues for corruption. Because once goods are cleared under single customer, they should enjoy free circulation, they move, should move. So now borders have become a stumbling block, especially for goods produced within the region. Why should you uh, uh, stop products which are produced in the region once they meet the rules of origin? Because we are under single customs territory. So those are areas, and um, the previous uh, presenter mentioned about a number of NTBs roadblocks, even here where we are, we used to have uh, from uh, Dar es Salaam to uh, Rusumo, we used to have more than 20 roadblocks. But again, I need to applaud uh, Her Excellency, the President. Currently, I was reliably informed there are only three roadblocks from Dar es Salaam to Chigari. Uh, to, to Chigari. So that means that this integration is all, uh, NTBs are being addressed, they are being removed. Though even those roadblocks are for security purposes. They are not to verify goods because it is not a lot of police officer to verify goods. It is not his mandate. He needs to allow the truck to move. I, so issues that um, I highlighted also led to common market. The legal compliance. I remember when I used to work with a uh, uh, trademark in Rwanda, and we, we, we had what we call uh, legal compliance, aligning the, uh, uh, again, you, 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 you hear that, uh, I think it is not a, a challenge. Language should be one of the tools we need to use. But uh, we had the issues related to uh, those who are speaking French, uh, the, the French law vis-a-vis uh, the, the, the British laws. But that al alignment, I think, has been done in terms of what they call the legal compliance audit. But the implementation has been one of the challenges. The legal, uh, I think the legal instruments are in place, the alignment, harmonization, they are all, they, are, they have been done, but ha the implementation, and I think that is the question in terms of enforcement, in terms of implementing those rules. We used to have a common market scorecard, again, funded by, by, uh, by World Bank, and it was a very good, excellent tool, and I want to encourage uh, my brother from East African Law Society and I know uh, Uganda Law Society had initiated it to develop that tool to look at the, the gaps in our legal systems. Because one of the challenges, to, to be sincere to you, the business community are facing is what we call cabotage. Those from French-speaking uh, countries, you know the word cabotage, meaning that a Ugandan uh, one registered truck is not allowed to pick a cargo in Tanzania. Eh? So the, why? We should, we should move from saying this is a Rwandan truck, this is a Ugandan truck. We should talk about it is an East African truck. Hmm? The same, like, again, with legal professionals, and I know it is happening that 
you cannot practice eh? in Kenya when you cannot practice in a, in a United Republic of Tanzania when you are from Rwanda. So we need to, to resolve those barriers because they are impeding the growth of our entire regional trade. They are not genera generating prosperity, they are generating poverty among our population. And I think these are the things we need to discuss because those are some of the legal issues. We've been at the EABC advocating for open skies. It is really challenging to see that a ticket was coming from uh, Bujumbura to Arusha, it cost 1,000 US dollars. Well, from Bujumbura to Dubai is 500 dollars. Yeah? And, we, and, our, and, and, our, and our heads of state have invested in uh, different airlines. We have Rwanda Air, we have um, Uganda Air, we have Tanzania Air. It is not because we don't have those infrastructure, we don't have those airlines, but because of what we call cabotage. Yeah? We treat our own airlines as a foreign air. You know, we give more favorable treatment to like uh, Emirates or Qatar than they will give to our own airlines. And I think this is uh, what the legal pro uh, professionals should be advocating for. The charges, the fees that we, every year we are losing $200 million because of those rules. Because uh, East Africa want to move by air. We want to move by air. We are more, uh, we, we, we are modernizing. People want to move by air. But the cost of moving from one capital to another is exorbitantly very high because of the cabotage, because of the regulations, because of fees and the charges we impose on our own airlines. We treat our own, uh, we don't, we treat our own airlines as foreign airlines. I think these are the things that we need to, uh, we need to uh, reflect on. So as I, Again, moving to conclusion, again, to, I want to uh, appreciate, I want to really appreciate the, uh, the invitation by ABC and we, 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 we are very committed to continue to work with you. In terms of uh, addressing non-tariff barriers, uh, the issues of, of course, we are related to common currency, we need to also resolve that. We need to ensure compliance and uh, we ensure that uh, our rules and regulations serve the East African citizens. So the role, of, the role of lawyers is therefore to free, implement the integration agenda, interpret the, the treaty and the, its, its protocol as well as annexes, and guide, and guide the business, guide the citizens in terms of what the, the treaty talks about. With those few remarks, I want to thank you and appreciate you, and I wish you a good day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kalisa, for sharing with us what the East African Business Council thinks. I think you have highlighted the successes and you've also highlighted the issues that we need to pay attention to. Um, I think among the issues you have highlighted is the issue of the non-tariff barriers at the borders. And I think before you had hi highlighted the issue of the non-tariff barriers act, sorry, bill, that is now pending six years. Um, so those are things that we need to look at as lawyers. The issue of legal compliance, uh, open skies, of, um, open skies, which is very key in terms of enabling us to liberalize the airspace and you've warned us of, of, of cabotage. So thank you so much for that presentation. We'll now move to Honorable Dr. Kalu Kalumia, who is um, one of Uganda's most senior and highly educated advocates. He enrolled as an advocate of the High Court of Uganda in 1971 and has over 45, year, 45 years experience in legal diplomacy and related fields. He has lectured in law and politics at the, universities, at the universities of Makere in Uganda, Nairobi in Kenya and Harvard in the USA. He worked for the United Nations for 25 years in various senior postings in several parts of the world and holds the distinction of having negotiated and then established the first UN presence in South Africa during its transition period from minority rule under the system of apartheid to majority rule under full democracy. Um, Honorable Dr. Kalu Kalumia will discuss uh, the topic of, is it just a shaky union? What must we do to fully integrate as a region? Doctor, welcome.
Well, well, what can I say? Thank you so much, Bernard, for that very generous introduction. I think it would have been uh, useful to add that uh, I was a peasant boy who grew up right in the heart of Africa. You can feel the heart pulsating under your feet with our active volcanoes where by nearby which these gorillas reside. So that is the, it's a, even Uganda standards, later on East African standards, it's the remotest corner of Uganda and maybe of East Africa, right where the three countries converge. Sorry, right where the three countries converge, uh, DRC, Rwanda, and Uganda. Uh, let me start off by just saying, I'm not going to impose a long lecture, even a lecture to you, though, though I was one. I would prefer this, if I can, guide it to be an interactive discussion. Because the title I've been given, as you can see, is a rather provocative one. Uh, from what we have heard, previous speakers, definitely there must be divided opinion. So, but first and foremost, I come from Kampala Associated Advocates, one of the leading law firms in East Africa, committed to this society. To demonstrate that, I came heading a fairly large delegation. Where are the members of my delegation? Are they here? Can they stand up for recognition, so to say? I think we are supposed to be, we are supposed to be four in all. Uh, so this really shows the importance we attach to this, to this union. Uh, secondly, there are many K, I think there are some, I've seen some, K, A, alumni, K, uh, where are they? Claire, you, you are one, I can see you waving. But there must be, I thought Stephen was, oh yes, of course, but uh, St Stephen, Stephen, message, where is he from the, was it, is he from NEC? Yes, but there are quite a number. K has a big club of uh, students, law students who came in to intern, who came in to do their clerkship, and who have spread their wings elsewhere. Uh, we are also supportive of uh, establishing strong law firms in our region. To that extent, I was telling Sarah, having given us a very provocative presentation yesterday, very good presentation, that K helped in establishing the first law firm in South Sudan uh, upon its independence, if I may. The law firm of South, South Sudan Associated Advocates, SSAA, and its young lawyers were tutored at KAA. And we gave them a retired judge who was for a long time, cons we had two justices of the Supreme Court and and the principal judge as consultants at K for many years. So we deployed these in supporting some of these initiatives to strengthen regional law firms. So, thank you, thank you. So I think we are, to reassure Sarah again, uh, we are doing a good civic duty. Plus, we contribute to, I have the unit I supervise that writes reports for some of these major human rights organizations, World Justice Report. We contribute to it from Uganda. But we are probably not the only ones. And please don't say we are the source of the pessimism <laughs> yes, expressed yesterday. But we, are, we have a unit doing that. We, have a, we present reports to Trust International, which is an anti-bribery organization based in Washington, DC, uh, corporate bribery mainly. Uh, we, we write reports for the World Bank annually. Uh, the wa ease of doing business, uh, women in business, and we have a small a unit dedicated to that under my supervision. I say all this not to, you know, Project K as, uh, I'm sure there are many other law firms. Uh, I see Senior Counsel Shunubi here, former ex-president. 
I'm sure the firm is doing some work in that regard. And in other jurisdictions. What I wanted to do rather than read a presentation to you is to make this as participatory as possible. Uh, I want to ask you to bombard me with questions if I can answer them. Some of them actually probably have better answers. I, um, when I was growing up, I loved asking questions. Even as, even as a hard's boy, I would ask questions about the moon, about what, about, and so I got a nickname. And my nickname was Bakunda Kubaza. Those who understand Kinyarwanda here or Kirundi, we're <laughs> Bakunda Kubaza <laughs> means uh, he or she who likes asking questions. <laughs> and when I moved on to secondary school, I had a young teacher then who is well known to many of you here. Uh, but then he was a young man waiting to go to do his law school in, in the UK. And so during that interlude, he came to teach at our school in his district. We, we both came from Kegezi district, which is the southwest corner of Uganda. And uh, his name was no other than George Kanyehamba, who is well known here in these circles. So the first thing he, after introducing himself, and, uh, he said, look, I like children who, students, pupils, who, who bombard me with questions. God, what is, what is bombard now? So I quickly shot back and I said, sir, what is bombard? He looked at me, he said, look, do you have micro waste? I don't know whether some of you are familiar with that old dictionary. Those days we didn't have Oxford Advanced Dictionary. Micro waste was, of course I didn't. He said, because he wanted me to go back and research and come back with an answer to the question I had bombarded it to him. And uh, needless to say, uh, I didn't get the, I didn't get the answer until I had to look for a friend or a young man with a dictionary to, to find a word in, diction, in the dictionary. So I say all this because I think it's good to pose questions, discuss a provocative title like this one, is our union weak? Is our union, we call it shaky. What does that mean to us? Uh, it is probably, some would say, a rhetorical question. Uh, but certainly it provokes us to think into what the community or this institution that we, we treasure and we labor for, for many years by the way, uh, the latest version of the community, certainly which we, our leaders formulated together is, is much weaker than the original, the original ch when we were growing up at the University of Dar es Salaam and after. Uh, that's when Arusha became the capital of East Africa. Uh, it was under the older community, which was more solid. Indeed, when I went for my university studies at Cambridge and wrote my paper was on a comparative analysis of both communities. The European Economic Community, it wasn't then a union, and ours at the time. And ours was much more, much greater, in, was much greater integration uh, at the time. Common harbor, common bodies functioning the community, located in different parts of, of, that, of that community. There were three members then at the time. So the questions I would like to see center on um, what a Sheke Union. How many of us here, just put up your hands, how many of us think our community is Sheke in the sense of being fragile, weak, uh, wobbly? Uh, why pose this question? Uh, is it in order? 
And of course, I was asked how many think it is a strong and dynamic union. Uh, like once our, was it our economics minister in Uganda who once said, our economy is zoo. So is the community taking off uh, shortly? Having listened to a very optimistic presentation here, I think it is on the runway, ready to kick off to the sky. Others might think, no, the engine is not strong enough. It, it will crash as soon as it takes off, or supposed to take off. And what would be the mark of that success? Is it a monetary union? Is it freedom of movement for all its people, not just goods? Uh, goods, of course, have to be moved by people. But the community is more than that. It's more than goods. How shall we get intermarried as this if people are not moving freely together? How shall we lawyers practice regional law, community, if we have no freedom of movement, no freedom of establishment? So what are the hallmarks of a stronger union that we see lacking in the current one? And here, Please, I want, as I said, I want an interactive, because there will be no questions at the end, and I'm already taking five of my minutes. Sorry, sorry, I keep going away from, yes. So, do we have those? How many, let's put up our hands for a shaky union. Is it shaky? Claire thinks it's shaky. Sarah. These dynamic young Ugandan ladies think <laughs> our community is shaky. <laughs> uh, how many, it's a strong. And on the way to, get, to getting strong, ever stronger. Are we, eh? On the way. On the way to getting strong. Indeed. Huh? On the way to getting stronger, I think that would be the view of the great majority of people here. I see my time is up, but um, I have not answered fully. Well, the other question I wanted to ask very quickly is what, we, what would we like to see achieved? So by 2025, what, do we, what are the imperatives we need are so urgent now that we need to achieve by 2025? Maybe Sarah can, uh, please. I see the young lady behind you, and Sarah, you can come in. I'm still. Well, <clears throat> by 2025, I would want to see uh, border posts having artificial intelligence monitoring the goods that are coming in to avoid them being uh, camouflaged with other security items. I would want to see. Uh, uh, biometric identification being joint as East African people. And by 2025, I would want to see us having an East African president, East African currency, and East mm -hmm. African common goods for export. Yes. Thank you, thank you. Yes, Sarah. Dr. Bifra, I would like uh, to hear your comment and why I think they are the, the, the integration is a bit shaky. The recent developments in the region, especially the blocking of, of goods from one member state to another, the return to a bit of sovereignty and protectionism by member states, and the measures of reciprocity by the others where that have been affected. And the second comment is on the other barrier to the Common Markets Protocol on the free movement of labor, goods, and services, mm. where we see even us in the room as lawyers, we have barriers when it comes to practicing in other countries. Absolutely. What is the way forward, and why wouldn't I think the community is shaken? I think, well, first and foremost, we lawyers here must practice what we preach. I know most of us, great majority of us, will preach for a stronger integration, a stronger union. 
uh, in fact, probably even a federation. But that's still a dream. Uh, this we, integration is a process. We have to take it step by step. Unfortunately, due to political turbulences we have had in our region, going back to the Idamin regime when intruded on the scene and upset the Apocat, we still have these earthquakes, political earthquakes, that shake the foundations of our union. We have to overcome this. There is no way we can grow a prosperous and a durable community if we are still affected by violence, by insecurity. I was recently in my area of Kisoro, and I couldn't believe it. I have worked with refugees, for, but I have never seen such a biblical exodus. You know, people, women, children, even their goats, some brought, oh, it's really, 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 i never seen this. And they are residing in a place called Nyakabande. I'm sure many of you have heard of it. Uh, that is my village. Um, and the opposite side of the same hill where they are. And the residents, although we speak the same language actually with those people coming from Congo, that used to be part of Rwanda. It's now part of DRC. You know, Rwanda was not a colonial project in the sense that there were a number of powerful kingdoms in Africa which had, you may say, uh, elements of statehood which were going into maturity. The king of the Bakongo kingdom, in fact, when he first met the Portuguese, he wanted to establish, send an, amb an ambassador to, to Portugal and have an ambassador sent by what it was, King John or some of Portugal. But the king of Port Portuguese had other designs, uh, slave trade and so forth. So we had those strong kingdoms in Africa, West Africa, Central Africa, uh, and it was a colonial project to, to dismember them, to break them apart into pieces. So Rwanda actually lost more territory to Congo than it actually retained. And more territory to what became Uganda. Sorry, yes. So we have to labor and really realize now that, just my last, uh, the integration project we will need all of us, especially the member states primarily, to be aware that by coming together, by cooperation and integration, they are surrendering, they have to surrender part of their sovereignty, put it into common pool for the greater good of the community. But if you insist on this sovereignty, sovereignty, each of us will end up the loser. So I do appeal to all of us as we go back and from various fields we are in, and the legal profession actually is everywhere, in every sector of the state. Private practitioners, civil servants, army officers, court marshals, and all that. What ethical standards are we taking there? What legal standards are we taking in those endeavors? And then conformity with aims and objectives of this noble body. Thank you so much. President Bella uh, let's ask questions at the end of the session. Otherwise, when you ask questions when our presenters are still here, we shall be eating out on our time for our next speakers. Uh, President Bernard, over to you, to our next speaker. And if thank we can you. manage our time, let's try as much as we can. Thank you. Thank you, Doctor. And we thank you for the thoughts that you have shared, the importance of member countries um, remembering that they have to surrender a certain part of their sovereignty if this has to work. I think that's, that's a very key message um, um, that is challenging the process. Please, we have the next speaker, Mr. Tom Onyango, a senior partner at Triple OK Law. Um, and he's going to speak about the role of lawyers in building a unified community. I'll just simply say that uh, he has the real estate and banking team at Triple OK Law LLP. He has a reputation for providing innovative, well reasoned, and commercially sensitive advice to every client on his portfolio. Tom, we are now waiting for your innovativeness, and this time commercially sensitive advice on what role we should play in building a unified community. Over to you. Uh, thank you, President uh, Bernard Undo, for the introduction. 
Um, my firm is Triple OK Law Advocates. I will not torture my fellow participants with asking my colleagues who are here to stand, but we are six uh, from the firm um, to represent the firm, and I hope that uh, <coughs> we'll benefit from the discussion. I think in preparing for this, I just asked myself, what is it that as East Africa community we are looking to build? And um, I did some reading on uh, a gentleman called Simon Sinek. And one of his writings is uh, something on the reason why we do things. So he says, start with why. Why do we have the, why do we have the community? Why do we want it unified? And I just thought I would share with you a few facts and figures about the community, because then you can sort of figure out where it sits in the spectrum of things. We are about 350 million people. <coughs> and the total GDP, as has been reported earlier, $300 billion. There are seven countries. If I just give a quick rundown of the GDPs of the various countries, Tanzania is uh, sitting at $62 billion uh, projected at the end of this year. Rwanda, $11 billion. Uganda, $34 billion. Burundi, $2.7 billion. Congo, $51 billion. Uh, Kenya, uh, South Sudan, sorry, uh, $2 billion. And Kenya is sitting at $107 billion. When you add all those billions, it gives you just about $300 uh, billion. This is what 350 million of us are able to generate in a year, because that's a GDP. Belgium has 11.8 million people. They generate $610 billion. So there we are 30 times more, but they generate twice as much as we do. The European Union in total, so I've given the figure for Belgium, but the European Union has a population of 198 million, give or take. And they generate $16, billion, $16 trillion in a year. The United Arab Emirates, guess how many they are? They are only 10 million. So if you compare them to, to, to East Africa, to the, the, the member states of the community, we are 350 million, they are 10 million, but they generate roughly the same GDP as we do, which means if we are um, 30 times more with the same GDP, the per capita GDP is 30 times higher than us. I said all this because I think when you go back to the question of why, why East African community? Why lawyers? Why do we need to discuss this thing? We need to discuss it because I think at the end of it all, we need to figure out where do we want as lawyers to facilitate the direction of the community. And we can facilitate it towards the examples I've given, or if we are happy with what it is now, we'll not make any changes. And I think it's important. Let us see what is it that we can do, even in our discussions, to facilitate a better community. We have talked about suspicion um, among the member states, but we are fighting over crumbs when you look at it in the context that I've given. We are fighting over crumbs because it is very little that we are fighting about. The question we have to ask ourselves, what can we do to bake a bigger cake for the East African people, the 350 million of us? And until we answer that, we are, um, we are not doing a, a service to our clients, that is the, the, the states. Is the community meant to just create jobs? Or is it just meant for us to look good and try and relieve the old days when we are competing or when we are better than the e European Union. So I'll just quickly touch on, on three areas. Uh, I've given uh, a background. Uh, I want to uh, discuss the role of lawyers in, um, in, in this background and then look at just the challenges that we face. The Article 76 of the, the treaty establishing the common market provides for free movement of labor, goods, services, capital, and the right of establishment. That is the theory. That is the theory because all of us know we are practitioners. I am from Kenya. If today I had a matter to represent anybody from Kenya in a traffic court here on Monday, I would not be able to do it because it is not possible. Um, but is it possible? And I think uh, in my recommendations, I'll, I'll address that issue. It should be possible. 
Um, so the first thing is, the, the, the laws are there. So the first one is that one, uh, the, the treaty establishing the, the right to work and to live and do all those things are there. The, the practice of law is either regulated very differently in the seven countries. Um, obviously our backgrounds are different. Uh, some of us have a common law background. Um, Rwanda and Burundi have a, a heritage uh, that is more uh, uh, Belgian and French, and so they use civil law as the basis of their law. Um, Tanzania, Uganda, and Kenya are kind of common law based, and obviously the, the, the way they handle these things uh, is slightly different. Still, there will be differences in our specific laws that we, we probably need to look at harmonizing. Should we therefore, should we answer my question, as to why we need to harmonize those laws so that even though it's common law, there will be nuances in each country about what each law provides for, but generally, we're moving in the same direction in that regard. Um, I've talked about Rwanda and Burundi. Um, South Sudan, um, I think it's still a very nascent economy, and uh, uh, even in terms of development of the law, I think uh, we've, we've had occasion uh, to be consulted uh, on a very uh, light note in terms of uh, legislation in South Sudan. Um, so th they're working on it. There's not much that I can say about Congo and, and the kind of laws, but I would imagine that because they're a Belgian, uh, an ex-Belgian colony, that a lot of their laws are civil rather than common law. Now, in terms of practice, uh, I want to ask what sort of form may cross-border practice take? And uh, there are several uh, 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 points I want to raise there. There is temporary provision of legal serv uh, services across boundaries. So again, to give the example that, to go back to the example that I gave, as a Kenyan, I could, could I be temporarily allowed to practice here, not on a permanent basis, but on a specific matter or a specific case, um, and that could be, you know, across board. So if I know the law sufficiently enough for a client in Rwanda to trust me better than a Rwandese lawyer, would I be allowed to represent that person? There is also, secondly, uh, acting as a legal consultant on foreign law. So though you may be Tanzanian, and you're, you, could be asked to, you could be asked to consult on laws in another country. Um, so for example, you could be a Rwandan advocate who, come in, who comes to Kenya to act as a consultant on short-term basis. So there's a project in one country. The people consulting, because it involves Rwanda law in this case, would come and consult on that regard. Then you could also look at it uh, as a third point, establishment of a foreign law practice in a host country. So for example, a Ugandan advocate would set up a firm in Rwanda to, among others, advise various stakeholders, such as the members of the business community that may want to invest in Uganda regarding Uganda law. Number four, e entering into a partnership with a law firm in the host country. In that case, you'd have a Burundi law firm or a Tanzania law firm and a, and a Rwanda law firm joining forces. In so doing, they would merge and uh, they would deal with margins and acquisitions easily as th that process would be enhanced. Then you could also become a member of the host country bar either through an examination or through reciprocity. That is a, a question of uh, mutual recognition. So um, again, the bar associations uh, of the seven countries which are represented here could look at ways in which you can have mutual recognition. And finally, the sixth point is um, regarding arbitration work where a, 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 law, uh, a lawyer from any South African partner state would be permitted to represent any client before an arbitration tribunal in any other partner state. Second thing, I want to look at uh, what, lawyer, what role lawyers have played in East African community um, in terms of development of the law and the jurisprudence. We've had a number of cases that have been decided and um, we had the, the judge president of the, the court here earlier on taking on an issue regarding Kenya's reference to the East African Court of Justice regarding the recently concluded elections. Obviously, um, they, there will be uh, different ways of looking at this. I'm sure government will see it differently from uh, the private sector. But I think in those cases, in my views, whether they succeed or they fail, they set the law. Because until you test the law, you do not know. So we've got an East African Court of Justice. What are the limits of its jurisdiction other than through its pronouncements. So we will see, uh, we'll see what comes up, uh, but th there are already a number of decided cases which have, um, I think, with time, established the principle of local standard in these courts and the access to, to the court. 
um, which is a good development. Lawyers can also enhance dispute settlement and contribute towards promoting access to justice. That is one of our key roles, of course. How do we promote access to justice? And, and obviously, there, there, there are many ways of looking at these things. Um, we were taught in law school about the rights of people to access justice. Whether you win or lose, your ability to access a court and, ad and, and address it on your grievance should be held sacrosanct. We also have a role, thirdly, to promote the founding principles of East African community, which aid in implementation. So the community has adopted fundamental and operational principles that govern the achievements of its objectives. Through litigation, it's only through litigation that the lawyers can contribute through growing uh, legal jurisprudence um, in that in the community. And then to deepen the to deepen, um, we need to help in deepening the economic integration agenda in the community uh, by, by playing a key role and as a driver. Because ag again, a lot of these things, we have to be, see ourselves as facilitators of the environment in which we operate. Because a lot of things that we do, be it how do you regulate, uh, how do you reg regulate commerce, how do you regulate transport, how do you regulate citizenship, how do you regulate, how do you deal with security or insecurity. Then moving on, because uh, t time is running, um, the challenges we see, there is inadequate um, harmonization of legal standards. Uh, I've, I think I briefly mentioned that. The member states, um, in, in spite of the protocol, the, the laws and regulations across the African, East African member states are not uniform. So uh, uh, basic, from the basic to the not so basic, they're not uniform. I've had discussion here earlier on about the, the possibility of an East African president by 2025. My own view, you first have to have a constitution, isn't it? Because our constitutions are so different. What is permissible here in Tanzania is probably legal in another country. So we need to have that discussion, uh, first of all, and maybe go back to why. Why do you want to have an East African president? But those are things that we have to look at, look at and that will then lead to harmonization. Um, We've got varying legal systems. Uh, as I've talked about, we've got civil system, we've got uh, common law. So we need to look at that. How do we bring them together? We need to, uh, as lawyers now, as some, an, an in-house matter, look at the issue of reciprocity. We are not treating each other equally. So some people can practice in, um, in, in one country or across the region, while others cannot. That principle of reciprocity is something that needs to be looked at. I think Rwanda is a bit ahead of the other countries in terms of, of uh, uh, promoting or allowing reciprocity as a way of doing business. We've got a language barrier. Um, luckily, I think uh, I was in Rwanda some time back and already even then they were starting to, to insist on a lot of instruction in school being in English, which I think is moving us towards that. Uh, we're thinking about Swahili as, a, as an option. And then uh, the disparities in the bar associations. Um, the, the East African co community is made up of uh, in theory, seven bar associations. Yesterday I learned in the Democratic Republic of Congo, you've got a total of 27 bar associations. Did you know that? There are 27 because there are 27. So when, when, uh, when, when you look at that and the bar associations and the way they operate, that will tell you something that needs to be done. There are also other practical barriers, um, especially regarding free movement, free movement of people. Finally, just to wind up because uh, in the interest of time, Recommendations, we want to look at uh, harmonizing legal training. Initially, I think a, a lot of the old lawyers all went to University of Dar es Salaam for their training, and then uh, every country set up their law schools. And, and of course, that then means that the, the, the standards are different, the, the, the teaching is different, maybe something to look at, uh, how do you harmonize? Encouraging uh, practice advocates to acquaint themselves with the laws of each partner state is, is uh, one of the other recommendations. Sensitizing stakeholders such as the chief justices, the law reform commissions in the various countries, the members of the different national parliaments, and the national um, uh, and advocates in all the partner states, and the public on the benefits of cross-border legal practice. It has to be something that is beneficial to our clients, otherwise it's dead in the water. There's no point of me clamoring to be allowed to practice in Burundi when there's no practical benefit to my client or my doing so. Um, we need to amend the uh, national advocates practice laws, regulations, and pro administrative provisions to allow for cross-border practice. And then um, one 
thing that, uh, we'd, we want to look at, is it possible to have um, an East African practicing certificate? And if you look in the future, so that you do not have the, either you have a recognition system, so that my practicing certificate can be recognized as, uh, as valid in Tanzania, or in Uganda, or in Congo, or have a certificate, the way we have a passport, we have a passport that is an East African passport. So it's possible also to have a practice certificate because it, it, it just shows that in your uh, country of origin, somebody somewhere has checked on your, uh, your qualifications and your eligibility to practice. So in conclusion, I think I've tried to keep my time. As we deliberate on this, my fellow uh, professional colleagues, let us start with why. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. I think we'll start with his last point. Is it possible for us to have an East African practicing certificate? I think that's what we would all look forward to for cross-border practice. Um, so thank you, Tom. We're going to allow questions from the plenary. Please, um, I'll ask you to be precise. Uh, if you're making a comment, please, I'll ask you kindly. Let's have the microphone. Thank you. Uh, my question goes to Dr. Kalu Kalumia. When he talked about earthquakes, he did not mention the biggest earthquake, which is tribalism or tribal bigotry in our countries. Can you hear me? You can't? Okay. So when you talked about earthquakes, you did not mention tribal bigotry which is the biggest earthquake facing our countries. Looking at South Sudan, tribal bigotry is there. If you go to remember the, the, uh, what happened in Rwanda, it was a tribal bigotry. What is happening in Congo with more than uh, 320 tribes, there's a big tribal bigotry in Congo. So how can East African lawyers, societies, talk about union without mentioning the legal aspects of solving tribal bigotry. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for your question. Brief to the point. Next, uh, Dr. Kalumia, the question is about tribalism. You'll answer it later. Just note it down. Okay. It's about tribalism. I just want to take very quick questions because yeah. we have to step out for a break. Thank yeah. you. Thank yeah. you, uh, Chairman. Please yeah. go ahead. Yeah. Th th thank you for very insightful presentations. My question is this to all of you or any of you. We have looked at the legal impediments to mm. regional integration and therefore cross-border practice. What is the role of culture in this? Because if you lack a culture of integration, even if you have all the legal instruments enabling you to practice across the, the border, there will be a problem. So what's the role of culture in this? Yes, Honourable Member of Parliament, please note that one. Oh, Mwalimu. What's the role of culture? Behind, let me also ensure that I am balancing the gentleman at the end, then I'll come to the side. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, I think I want to appreciate the presenters for a very uh, articulated I mean, uh, presentation they did. I just don't want to say a lot of things, but I just want to focus on the geopolitics. Please mention your name. I'm Cosmos, Council Cosmos from South Sudan. All right, thank you. Uh, mine is just a comment and maybe just a question that I'm going to put. You, you know, one of the factors uh, we talk about geopolitics of the countries, you know, like countries like South Sudan and Congo, we are the new countries who really joined join this Africa. And we are aware, very, we are very, we are all of us are aware that our countries are in war and so many things. My brothers mentioned something very important about uh, tribalism, and not only that, but as a geopolitics going on, it, that makes South Sudan, for instance, those countries who are very poor, who are actually in war, become dumping area for the goods, because they cannot participate in the market today. They cannot produce. 
So my, my question that I want to pose to the community today, how do we participate in order to bring crimes to those countries so they become more stronger to, to participate together with us in this all in this in the the market or other cross border Thank you. Thank Thank you. You. We have your question. Um, uh, Mr. Kalisa, please take up that one from South Sudan. Um, balancing again. I'll come this side, I'll come this side. Mr. Kalisa, please take up that one. How do you help South Sudan to become more effective when it has become a dumping? Mm. Thank, mm. thank you. Um, my name is Okele Geoffrey Charles, a member of parliament from Uganda. Mm. Um, thank you for the uh, uh, presentations. Um, the
Um, the, the way th this is just, in my view, one of the issues. Customs management is one of the issues. It's probably one of the more important issues, but it is one of the issues. From the discussion that we've had, the, the, there will be piecemeal amendment of laws so that we, we deal with issues. And, and I'm hoping that with it, we're working towards a situation where if I'm, if I'm uh, a truck driver from Kenya and I'm, I'm going uh, from Kenya to Burundi or to Congo, that bill addresses the question of how much time do I spend in the border between Kenya and Uganda, between Uganda and, and Rwanda, between, uh, and then between Rwanda and Congo. I think that is the overarching thing. And for us as lawyers in this room, the question is, um, when these laws, of the bills are being discussed, what I see in, in Kenya where there's a, a greater attempt to, to involve lawyers in the, the discussions and the thinking behind the bills, is that there's not much participation. So the bill is drafted by a separate group of people as mandated by law. It ought to be subjected to comment and discussion and thinking by lawyers, and that doesn't happen as much as it could. So you have a situation where um, uh, laws are being passed. Um, uh, in my view, the, the problem is piecemeal, piecemeal because we are addressing specific problems without going through the overarching issues that the country needs to deal with. So hopefully it can cure a number of the issues that we have. Um, if you go to any border between all these seven countries, in between them there will be, there will be trucks, queues and queues of trucks. There's a time in, in Kenya for one reason or the other, I think during the COVID period, there was a 40 kilometer queue of trucks waiting to get into Uganda because of, um, I think it was the COVID uh, testing or st stuff like that. Now, that was a pandemic, but how do we deal, how do we move to us a situation where you can travel seamlessly and work seamlessly throughout the community? If you go to the UAE, you can work, live in one emirate and work in another. Is that possible in Kenya? If I'm a Kenyan, and I live in, um, in a manga on the Kenyan side, can I work in Arusha? Such that I travel every day, I make the one, one hour, one and a half hour trip every day. It's, it's probably a difficult thing, but really that's what we should be working towards, a situation where we've got seamless connectivity, and we see ourselves as a community rather than seven different countries trying to cobble together. Um, the other question was uh, whether it is possible to have a harmonized legal system. Of course it is possible. Where the world wants it to, da to, 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 to be done, it is possible. Is it easy? No way. Because there are so many in individual interests. We've talked about bigotry uh, in, in, in an earlier question. We've talked about culture. We've talked about, um, um, I think earlier on, we talked about suspicion. All these issues will stand in the way of having harmonized systems. Because you think, if I do this, what will country A do to me? In uh, not even in retaliation, but what will be the consequence of having that harmonized structure? If you look at the example of the countries that have gone a little further ahead, especially the European Union, what then happens is, obviously, uh, I, I hear people who are talking about different economic levels. That is everywhere. In every family, you have differences, but you still have a common goal. Even within in the individual countries, regions are different, but you have a common goal. In East Africa, we will always be different. There's no time when we will be the same because of uh, economics, because of geography, because of resources. That is, a, to me, that's part of life. I, there's no time when we wait and when everybody's at the same GDP, then we uh, consummate the, the, the community. It will never happen. Thank you. Thank you. Doctor? Thank you, thank you. <laughs> I don't know, I was provoking being bombarded with questions. <laughs> I used to bombard some, but that's good. If only I can try and answer them in the time that we have. Mm. Tribal bigotry. My brother there, young brother there raised this issue. I don't know whether really this is the principle cause just of the many conflicts that we see on our continent. Certainly the conflict in Libya was not brought about by bigotry. Uh, and you see where Libya is and what that has led to the whole Sahel totally destabilized. External forces brought that about. Certainly Sudan 
and South Sudan in particular, was not primarily driven by bigotry. There are many factors, whether it is struggle for division, equitable distribution of power, equitable access to resources, but just simply bigotry is not enough. The genocide in Rwanda, they, nobody, look, those in Rwanda, of which I am one, but from Uganda, so I'm uh, um, Uganda in Rwanda, uh, like you have those in Masisi, they are Banyarwanda Kongole. Then you have those in Tanzania. I don't know what we call them. I know they are Bahanga then, but they are related to and some groups in Karagwe which were, had links with. And of course you have Burundi, which is uh, an identical twin, almost, of Rwanda. Now once upon a time, those two kingdoms were one, but it's many centuries back. There was a conflict between the princes and one two called Burundi, another another Rwanda, that's what our ancestors tell us. But that's way, way, way back. Unfortunately, no written record for that. So these conflicts are quite often driven by foreign forces, but not exclusively. Those foreigners exploit weaknesses within our societies, and primarily poor leadership that fall to these trap, into these traps. I can only say for South Sudan, I mean, nobody can prescribe a solution to it. The Pope tried, even knelt and kissed the, the feet of, um, of these competitive rivals, and it led to nothing. East African leaders are trying. I hope, I wish them all the success. Uh, the UN, well, the UN has been in DRC. I worked for the UN. Uh, in DRC for how many decades now? Yeah. S has the hugest expense in terms of operations of the UN and peace operations. Uh, it has failed to, partly, Congo is a, a rich, rich, big, big country with very weak infrastructure. The route of the central government, Kinshasa does not run to easily to the borders of this great state put together, assembled together by colonialists from different Bandundus in the south, uh, Lubas uh, near Zambia, uh, Banyarwanda near Uganda, uh, of course up north, because we have a long border. So that's all I can say on South Sudan, but we shall have the chance to talk. Thank you. Uh, the, other the other question was, on the question of, uh, uh, sorry, sorry, uh, leadership and getting something to, to be done to the organs of our East African community. What can we amend, what can we change to make it less conflictual, to make it less, especially at the summit level. My proposal would be to try and see whether we cannot do what the Europeans did and the, the Union has grown organically from the Treaty of Rome, um, Maastricht, Monetary Union, to what it is today. And that is by having a strong central body in the capital of the East African community, wherever we choose. Our Council of Ministers, in my view, that organ should have more delegated powers given to it than leaving everything to be decided by the big men. Currently, the Council of Ministers is really a weak body. It is not mm -hmm. delivering on its money, but I will defer to the honorable. Excuse me, calling you. Mm -hmm. I don't know what I've been called. <laughs> so that is, um, um, I cannot answer each and every question. I think I will try to engage with, as for Mandela and having a dinner with him, well, I had a few dinners with him, but more at his home or at organized by the movement than at my home. But he certainly insisted on meeting my family, my children. I can share with you later some of the photographs. I uh, invited me home to attend the wedding with his daughter Zinzi. 
I was the only actually foreigner. Contrary to the reception, the reception was in a Carlton Center where I attended diplomats and where, but I had an after dinner, uh, rather an after reception dinner, so I was privileged at least. So I got to know him well, thank God. And, but Mandela and a few others in Africa mentioned the importance of leadership. It's a central ingredient in any project that we, and they shouldn't just be visionary leaders. A vision, vision, this vision thing, as someone called it, uh, but strategic in their thinking. The vision, yes, we all have visions, but how do we get, translate those visions into action? Thank so you. That, that is final one subject I wanted just to scratch, if yes. we were open. Okay. And that is, uh, one of the mentioned China, increasing role, presence of China. Now, China has set up, I'm sure many of you are familiar with these acronyms, BRI, in the context of China. BRI, do you know BRI? Come on. Yeah. Belt, Belt Road Initiative. Initiative yeah. Then there's another acronym that we must be, we must get to be familiar with, read about it, understand it. That is CICC. CICC, it's a quiz, it's related to BRI, that is, huh? <laughs> well, yeah. to be quick and brief, it is a new court they have established called China International, International uh, China International Commercial Court, International Commercial Court. It was established in 2018. I posed this question, we discussed it, uh, my law firm, we have Monday meetings where we discussed, and this lady was submitting an international arbitration and, and very good presentation, but she had completely ignored this and uh, flagged it, and she went and did some research, even to me, which was very revealing. This B, B, uh, CICC is gonna have or has exclusive jurisdiction on, over disputes arising from BRI projects. When we have a dispute in Uganda over whatever airport or whatever this, it has to go to Beijing. It cannot be taken to arbitration locally or inter well, as we found of doing to our former colonial masters. No London business, no Padiams in Paris. We have to go to Beijing. The language is in Chinese, official language. So we have to learn Mandarin. At least those of us who are dealing with this Belt and Road Initiative. Now that court has, uh, has uh, five or so expert committees from different regions of the world where the uh, road in, uh, this BRI projects are being undertaken. Uh, the chairman of one of those committees, on Af the expert committees on Africa, is uh, K's founding partner, Bart Katurevi, who was later Chief Justice of Uganda. And there is a judge, a labor judge from Algeria. All this is on Google, by the way. That's what <laughs> so I told my young lady, please go to Google and find out. Have there been any cases referred one so far to, to that court? Thank you, Doctor. We so are not pressed on time, please. Please be mindful about that quote Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I have to, uh, to respond to two questions. I'll start with the easy one uh, about the parliamentary process and whether there is a calendar which indicates which bills are going to be uh, put to public uh, scrutiny and if the lawyers can participate. Uh, I should say. I appreciate your presence here, and I'm surprised to see how many you are. Uh, East African Law Society here in Arusha is helping us very much with uh, public engagements when it comes to the issue of uh, meeting with the public to get their views regarding different bills. Yes, there is a calendar. Each committee, which has been given a bill to work on, provides a calendar, and uh, they share it with stakeholders. 
The problem is now, the real problem is lack of capacity, financially and technically. You are given maybe one or two days to scout, look out for participants. A list comes in of those who are supposed to come and participate in giving views and opinions regarding a particular bill, and you're supposed to finish in a day or two. And you don't meet again up until uh, four months later. Yeah? First of all, that's compromising the quality of, uh, of the whatever you're going to produce, and it also compromises uh, the integrity of the bill that you're going, you, you know what I mean, the bill that you're going to work on. We had a, a mining bill by Chris Otoka. Yeah? That mining bill, the East African mining bill, was supported by a number of stakeholders in order to, to, to change the content and make it, to align it with the policies and the laws in respective partner states. But we didn't have the capacity. We have only one draftsman for the entire community, for heaven's sake. We have a few researchers who can work on research for a particular topic. So that is a bit scary. And I think we need to invest as East African community, and if we have the secretariat here, we need to invest more in people's capacities in the East African community and the secretariat, different departments, in order to come up with quality and workable, operationable uh, bills and, uh, and different uh, regulations. I think I've answered, and I think uh, maybe we request uh, East African Law Society here in Arusha to uh, engage more with us and with the parliament in order to disseminate information and to demand, I mean, we need to demand, I'm an activist a bit, to demand that uh, the East African community and East African uh, uh, Legislative Assembly publishes openly and timely all the bills that are going to subject to people's uh, to, uh, collection of opinion. That Thank you, Mualimu. The second one, I have a second question okay. to respond to. It's about um, the issue of, yes, we have legal impediments. I was, I was not quite sure about that. Uh, regarding the cross-border practices, where, what is the role of culture in integration? It's a huge subject. All our borders. Eh? Uh, 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 populated by people who relate to each other. Mm -hmm. Their cultures are very similar. But then we have uh, this East African culture, which is a habit, practice, and process. Mm -hmm. uh, after a long time, it becomes a culture. Now, we have cultures of organizations. Certain organizations have cultures that they're very rigid, they're closed, they don't want to share, and so on. But when it comes to people and their culture, and what they want to do on the ground. I think it is hard time we learn and relearn what we've learned about uh, integration. Because I think very seriously that uh, once we close our boxes and we think that we can operate in a particular way, and we remain in those boxes, it's very uh, difficult to understand what is outside the box that is regarding the culture. Last but not least, regarding the custom union, is it custom union or about the Program Remedies uh, Committee? Uh, we have been fighting to get uh, amendments so that uh, the Trade and Revenues Committee is being uh, established. Arabo Makame has been working on it time and again, and I think. We are now on the verge of getting it established. Okay. There are many, many impediments regarding that, but I think they have been cleared now after five years of struggle to get it going. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mualimu. Thank you. And lastly? Um, yes, thank you. Uh, mine is a very quick one, uh, just a response to the delegate from the Republic of South Sudan on South Sudan being a dumping ground. And indeed it is true, but uh, again, this is the, the whole issue about uh, um, the, 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 um, the political economy of uh, regional integration. The political economy of regional integration is anchored under three, three eyes. One, institutions, and this is what we are discussing now. Two, incentives, what is, my, what, what is in there for me? Then interest, what is your interest in joining the integration? Those are three eyes that are very fundamental in the integration. 
So uh, it happened that when, uh, you know, it, uh, it happened that I was part of the, the team, I was working with Trademark in South Africa, posted in South Sudan, and I supported the South Sudan in terms of building the institutions, especially the Bureau of Standards, to have the right equipment, to, to have the right uh, staff, in terms of uh, detecting, testing, for the product that are coming to that country. And I think the professor mentioned that I was there during even the, the, the war 2016. I was caught in crossfire. It happened in Juba during a broad day time. So these institutions that we are trying to be built were disrupted by the war. So currently, a number of donors have withdrawn from their, their, their support to the country, and especially the Bureau of Standards. But uh, ESC Secretariat is making an effort, again, to, the, to strengthen, to build these uh, trade-related uh, trade institutions, as including the Bureau of Standards, so that they have the, the right capacity, the right staff, the right equip equipment in terms of testing the product that are entering that country. So I think that is, uh, uh, I think that is what we are doing. And uh, I've been even engaging myself, uh, despite that I left the, uh, South Sudan, I've been supporting the Bill of Standards in terms of uh, ensuring that they get the right support from the ESC Secretariat, from the South African Business Council, that we continue to build their capacity to be able to detect, to be able to test, to be able to ensure that the goods coming to that country meet the right standards. I think that is uh, the response from my side. But uh, lastly, again, as uh, I mentioned, I'm very optimistic about the integration, about the ESC integration. Despite all these challenges, but ESC is the most performing regional economic community. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much, our panelists. Thank you so much, our panelists. I want to first of all to thank the audience for being attentive, and uh, I know that we are between, uh, we need to have a very quick break. Um, so thank you so much, the audience, and thank you so much, the panelists. Thank you, thank you, thank you again. We're going to have a quick break of just about 20 minutes. The next panel is going to be led by Dr. Alan Shonubi. It's again a panel on East African integration. I'll hand over back to the moderator. Thank you. Uh, a round of applause for our the speakers. I think they've done justice to this topic. Friends, we overshot a bit, so I want to apologize. But we still have a very serious panel lined for us. If you could only take a five minutes break and come back and rush through this before you can break off for lunch. We also have breakout sessions in the afternoon. Don't uh, miss out that. We have breakout sessions. <laughs>
start our session right away. It will be a brief and very fast session because a lot of, uh, has already been covered. Um, my name is Dr. Alan Shalubu, Senior Counsel from uh, Rwanda, from the law firm of uh, Shalubu Musoke and Company. I think we have eight lawyers here today from, from our firm, and um, there's someone within the audience. Without much ado, um, our topic is regional integration. And what we're going to talk about is the expansion of the East African community, which you all know. Uh, it has now been expanded from the three original East African countries of uh, Kenya, Uganda, and Tanzania. And we are going to now, of course, we now have Rwanda on board, Burundi on board, the Democratic Republic of the Congo on board, and South Sudan on board. So one of the things we're going to look at is what are the implications? We haven't yet um, consolidated the community as we envisaged it, but we're already expanding. Is that a good thing? Is that a bad thing? How are we going to look at that? Um, as you all know, the current European Economic Community was modeled on our former East African community. And um, that is also a good thing. So what implications does all that have for you? And your panel today, um, I'll start from the left. Sorry, that, that's your left, my right. Uh, Dr. Joseph Yav. Uh, Dr. Joseph Yav is the founding partner of Yav Associates from the Democratic Republic of Congo. And he will probably be telling us about their experience, which of the many law societies they belong to, and what changes they have, both as lawyers and a, a country um, moving into the East African community. Um, I have Mr. Robert Kapinga, who's also here. Uh, Robert is a former president of the East Africa Law Society and now practices with uh, Bono and company. Um, you remember, I remember him most because he took over um, after my term as uh, the president of the Law Society, of the East Africa Law Society. I've always been wanting to say this way, but, but I think two years is a bit short for presidents. <laughs> we won't ask you to talk on that, but uh, we'll talk later. Um, uh, we have uh, Stephen Lanzima, who is an advocate, and he's representing the Secretary General of the East African Community. Uh, he's also an advocate, but he'll also tell us a bit about the challenges um, that they are facing. Um, we have Ryan Kitkat, am I pronouncing it right? Very good. Ryan Kitkat, who is a partner, corporate, uh, managers and acquisitions, I believe, in uh, Romans. And um, he's also here, going to give us his views. So we'll start briefly with the issue of um, the expansion of the East African community and its implications, and how are we dealing with um, dispute resolutions. And I think, uh, uh, Mr. Nyozima, will let you start, because this is something I think, these are areas I think you are well versed with. Thank you very much. You can stand. Distinguished moderator, our fellow panelists, distinguished delegates and participants. Um, I've been introduced, I'm Nyanzima Stephen. I am uh, representing the 
the Secretary General of the East African Community, uh, Honorable Dr. Peter Mathuki, uh, who couldn't make it because of other uh, activities. Uh, in addition to what uh, the moderator has said, I am the head, I'm head of the department of labor and migration at the East African community. But before I came to the East African community here in Arusha, I also served as assistant commissioner for political and legal affairs in the midst of USC Uganda. I am an advocate of the High Court of Uganda and also uh, a regional integration expert. Among others, I've participated in the negotiations of the admission of the Democratic Republic of Congo into the community. I will briefly make a presentation uh, without uh, going through what has been talked about. I wish to say that integration, the ES integration is on the right path, and I agree with Dr. Karumia about that. Because integration is a sine qua non, it is inevitable, it must be there because of the reasons explained. We are one people with one destiny. Some of us who come from borders, I come from southwestern Uganda in Kisoro. I'm also a neighbor of the mountain gorillas like Dr. Karumia. We are border people. I'm sure even our, our president, Dr. Wundo, is a border person. So we are the ones who kept the candles burning for integration. Because with or without the common market, without the East African Community Treaty, people were moving. We were already moving. So what the heads of state have done is to formalize that movement through these protocols that have been talked about. Uh, the community has indeed expanded. I have not go through what has happened. Only to say that uh, we are also aware that uh, the expansion actually started when we had the Republic of Rwanda and the Republic of Burundi acceding to the treaty in June 2007. Later on, we saw the Republic of South Sudan uh, depositing the instrument of ratification with the Secretary General in September 2016, and also saw the DRC admitted and also they deposited their instrument on 11th July this year. So in terms of demog demographics, I, do, I may not need to go through that. The population, the combined GDP have already been talked about. But we have also seen the integration expand in terms of, in terms of institutional establishments. In addition to the summit, the council, the coordination committee, and other structures, we have eight institutions that have been established uh, since 1999. We have the Inter-University Council for East Africa that is based in Kampala, just behind Chambog University that is dealing with university education. We have civil aviation, safety, and security agents oversight commission that is based in Entebbe, Uganda. We have the East African Health Research Commission that is dealing with health research at a strategic level. This is based in Bujumbura in the Republic of Burundi. We have the East African Competition Authority, which is here in Arusha. We have the Kiswahili Commission based in Zanzibar, here in, in, in Yorati here, in the Republic of Tanzania. We have Lake Victoria Basin Organization based in Jinja. And we have Lake Victoria Basin Commission that is based in Kisumu in the Republic of Kenya. So in terms of institutions, we have indeed expanded. Uh, there was also an issue, <coughs> an issue of how do we bring the community closer to the people. Is the community a matter of the area members, civil servants, business community? No. The Secretary General, in addition to what the area is doing and the East African Court of Justice, through the rotational activities in partner states, the Secretary General is mandated under the treaty from Article 125 to 128 of the treaty, the Secretary General brings the community closer to the people. Uh, this is an annual event, and the Secretary General interfaces with our people, whether they're in the markets, whether they're uh, uh, at fish landing sites, in, the mar in uh, other civil society establishments, and he engages fully with them, and they also share views with the Secretary General about how they feel on the East integration. There was an issue on culture, culture is also provided for in Article 119 of the treaty, and we normally have annual events which we call Jumuiya Africa Mashariki Festivals, 
where we market our cultural um, products, our cultural behaviors, our cultural foods, our health related cultural um, developments, and this one happens every after two years. The last one was held in Bujumbura in September this year. So there are quite many aspects of integration that you can talk about. I'm also aware that in some universities, they, they teach the East African community law. Others teach it in political science as regional integration. So therefore integration is as wide as that. We cannot finish. But briefly, the implications of our expansion mm -hmm. are also quite many. We have eliminated non-tariff barriers in our community and our colleague from East African Business Council talked about that. We enacted the East African Non-Tariff Barriers Act of 2017. We are also implementing the East African Community Law and this law takes precedence over similar national ones. So the, all of these have uh, <coughs> boosted and promoted free movement of goods in our community. We are implementing uh, a common external tariff that is seen in four structures. We have zero uh, tariff on raw materials, 10% uh, on intermediate goods, 25% on finished goods, and also 35% on finished goods but available in the community. This one is also being implemented. We are implementing the East African Single Customs Territory. Uh, here, the message is, the implication is that goods would take 18 days from an, like in the Northern Corridor, 18 days from Mombasa to Kampala. Uh, this one has reduced it to four days, and they also take about 21 days from Mombasa to Kigali. And now under the Single Customs Territory, we are having five days from 21. Under the Central Corridor, uh, we, we have also goods coming from Dar es Salaam to Bujumbura. This one has significantly reduced from 22 days to only four days. Uh, we are also uh, having the one-stop border posts. We have the OSBP Act of 2016, and this one is used to fast track a movement of goods and persons. Where we have, for instance, a person in immigration is now taking about three to five minutes from the previous 10 or more. Movement of person is very fundamental, colleagues, and uh, this one is the cornerstone of integration. And somebody talked about the East African passport. We have now a passport that is using regional agreed standards. And this passport is electronic and it is compliant with the International Civil Aviation Organization standards. Persons have been moving either for tourism, for medical treatment, uh, for other lawful purposes. And we always have information on how movement has happened every after six months. Students are also moving in the community freely, and students are issued a visa gratis. We also abolished the visa. There's no need for a person to pay visa when you're coming from Kenya to Uganda like that. If South Sudan also recently uh, removed the visa requirement, we are now working with the DRC upon the admission to ensure that they also remove a visa requirement as provided for in the ESC common market. Other aspects I think have been talked about, like mutual recognition of academic and professional qualifications. My colleague was there yesterday talked about the MRAs. We are done with engineers, accountants, veterinarians, and the architects. Uh, the one for lawyers indeed was finalized. We are only waiting for signing. In terms of establishment, rate of establishment, we have witnessed uh, cross-border investment uh, increase. By 2010, we were at 190 million US dollars, but according to the figures we have, by 2021, we had uh, grown up to 583 million US dollars. For workers, that one is also provided for. Workers are moving, they obtain work permits, and they also have statistics on the, their movements every after six months. I will talk about also the monetary union as the third stage uh, where uh, the East African Monetary Institute Act was passed and it is being implemented mm -hmm. in preparation for single currency by 2024. Political Federation, the Council has directed and advised that we can have political confederation, not federation, 
so that confederation becomes a transitional stage towards the East African uh, Federation. Uh, there are a number of challenges which have also been highlighted, including delayed harmonization of laws, policies, and frameworks to ensure that they are in conformity with the EAC instruments, which has also affected the movement of professionals and other aspects uh, of integration. Other aspects to do with the awareness and the publicity is also a challenge, but we are making sure that we involve all stakeholders' integration so that everybody is aware about the ES integration, and therefore uh, it becomes very easy mm -hmm. for participating mm -hmm. and benefiting from the ESC. Uh, Honorable moderator, allow me to end my presentation. The rest of the issues probably will come up during the Q&A session. Thank you for listening. Thank you, uh, Stephen Nelson. Um, we talked about one people uh, that were already existing, especially for people across the border. Fast tracking of goods and movement, which is now being reduced to most, in most cases, four days. Visas abolished between the countries and the monetary union, which we'll be glad to see when it's actually implemented. So I won't take much more of your time. We have a problem of always when you're a speaker before lunch, you always have that uh, problem when you're standing between people and their lunch. So without further ado, I'll ask uh, uh, Dr. Robert Kapila, former president of the US, to come up and um, give us his view on the topic. Uh, Dr. Shinobi, my fellow panelists, ladies and gentlemen, I've been asked to, to discuss the East African community as a building block to the African free continental trade area. As usual with lawyers, they start with uh, defining terms. I had no clue what a building block is. So I did a bit of reading, and I didn't get a direct definition. It wasn't a brick. At least the African Union has recognized officially mm -hmm. certain regional economic uh, communities as regional blocks to the African free continental trade area. There are quite a few of them, and they're significant in uh, in the way we understand how trade is going to evolve under this agreement, the, the AFCTA agreement. They are, I'll name them very quickly. The first one is the Arab Maghreb Union. The second is a common market for Eastern and Southern Africa, COMESA. And then there's uh, another one, the community of the Sahel, Saharan states. The, the next one is, of course, the East African community. There's the economic community of the West African states, ECOWAS. The economic community of the Central African states. And then the Intergovernmental Authority on Development, commonly known as IGAD. And the Southern African Development Community, SADC. Now, all these are regional economic communities, they all have agreed some forms of, uh, of harmonization in trade. And as you might suspect by now, that there's actually overlapping membership in these uh, economic communities, uh, the regional economic communities. Uh, ju just just to, to, to demonstrate, in relation to East Africa, the, how, how, how our own community overlaps with many, many other uh, regional communities. Kenya, Uganda, and Southern Sudan are both in IGAD and the East African community. DRC is in three communities, the East and Central African um, community, the EAC, and the SADC. Tanzania is in both the SADC and the EAC. Burundi and Rwanda 
are in the East and Central African economic uh, uh, community as well as the EAC. So there's a lot of overlapping. And as you'd imagine, with such overlapping, th there will be complications in how you implement, uh, in the implementation process in the intra-African intra trade, which has been our concern. We're talking about lifting tariffs, etc. So, now, if you looked at the uh, African <coughs> continental free trade area, if you looked at the, oh, time is out, I should stop here, right? Oh, okay, I should wind up instead of stopping. Okay, so, uh, so, and now we, we can note very quickly that uh, the, the AFCTA has no supranational institutions. They are not, not like the East African community is attempting to do. And it's not intended to replace the regional economic communities which I just referred to, and which have already been formed and have their own free trade or common, uh, free trade areas of common, common markets. The articles of uh, the African free, African continental trade area indicates that they, they will exist alongside, and in fact, preserve the statuses of the already uh, constituted uh, economic integrations which we just, we just looked at, which we just mentioned. So the articles provide for that. Now, with that kind of, um, with that kind of position in terms of how you, you look at integration, we will be confronted with a situation, and it's harmonized, I don't know how the harmonization will be, because even in statistical terms, sometimes it's very hard to figure out how much of involvement Tanzania, Tanzania is an example, is in terms of trade within this uh, arrangement or within other uh, communities to be able to say what is the involvement of Tanzania in the free trade area because it is a bit there, a bit there, and you don't know if all of them are complete. So we have a, a huge task ahead of us. And to, be sh to ensure that there's this harmonization. Certainly, yes, it requires a political will amongst the now many, many other countries involved in this uh, exercise. And secondly, there will be a lot of innovation amongst lawyers to help in the process of harmonization. And I think that's very welcome. I'll stop here and maybe leave everything to discussion. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Robert. Uh, you emphasized the, the several regional economic um, committees, commissions, and um, organizations which have an overlapping effect on uh, several countries. So that's uh, food for thought and uh, probably will attract some questions. Uh, let me not waste much time and go straight to Mr. Ryan. Kit Kat from Bowman's, and uh, he will give his views on this matter. Abadi Zamtana, uh, please excuse me, I'm going to speak English. Bado Nachifunga Kiswahili. I was told that I have two minutes, so this is a compressed version of what I was going to say. Um, Harold Coe, the Dean of Yale University, uh, had a very nice saying, which I think is apposite. He said that theory without practice is as lifeless as practice without theory is thoughtless. Theory without practice is as lifeless as practice without theory is thoughtless. And I think here, talking about the EAC and talking about AFTA, we have certainly these very ambitious projects political, legal projects, trade projects, a lot of theory underpinning them at this stage. 
and a lot of practice to get to where we want to be as a community, as a continent, as people within that continent. Um, the topic I was given to talk about is opportunities for lawyers and their responsibilities in contributing to deeper economic integration in the EAC under AFTA. Um, there's a lot going on there. A lot of it has already been covered by Mr. Onyago at Triple OK, so I'm going to give a compressed version, I think, and I'll talk about responsibilities and then opportunities. I mean, to distinguish, I mean, Dr. Kapinga has talked about EAC as a building block for AFTA. Mm -hmm. EAC is a different beast. It talks to the objectives being widening and deepening cooperation amongst the seven partner states in political, economic, social, cultural fields, research, technology, defense, security, legal and ju judicial affairs for the mutual benefit of the seven states. Obviously, there's a lot going on there. We're focusing on economy here, but I think to make a broad comment, without the rule of law, it's very difficult to achieve economic integration, economic progress, um, economic development that is for the benefit of people within each of the countries within that cust the customs union or common market, whatever it is. Um, the same goes for AFTA. AFTA is a different beast. Um, it's a free trade area. There are, there are very few institutions. There's a secretariat, obviously. There's the Council of Ministers. To Dr. To Dr. Um, Kalumia's point, we don't have an EU body at the top. It's left to the, to the quote-unquote big men, um, which means it's reliant on, uh, very much reliant on political will um, to get things done. We, uh, and, and I agree with the recommendation that, that we have an institution that's independent of you know, ministers of trade that can drive things forward in, in, in f on enforcement and implementation front. Um, so in that context, what are our responsibilities as lawyers? And to give a loyally response, it depends, right? It depends. A lawyer from the DRC is in a, operating in a different environment to a lawyer from South, to South Sudan, um, to someone like me who's come from South Africa, um, you know, to someone from Tanzania. Uh, context, facts, and reasons, all very important. But ultimately, there's a vision. What are we trying to achieve? How do we get there? Those are practical questions. If you're in an environment that's autocratic and the law has been weaponized, I'm a Zimbabwean um, and I've seen and grown up in a country where the law has been weaponized and what that's done to the country. Um, the economy has imploded and we've got a long way to go to fix things. What do you as a lawyer, time has run out, what do you as a lawyer do in that circumstance? Do you go with the system and you're part of that, legal, that oppressive legal system or do you try to push back uh, a la Mandela and other great leaders um, and you know, thinking about law as a virtue, how do you push things along in a direction that will make sense and is for the benefit of our kids and future generations going forward? Um, so that's just something to think about. Obviously, uh, your primary role is to your clients <laughs> you know, advising them, that sort of thing. Uh, you, you have responsibilities insofar as the legal system places them on you in that particular country, X, Y, Z. We don't need to go into that. Opportunities, loads of opportunities. 16% um, of, of, of intra-regional intra trade in Africa as opposed to 60% in Europe, 68% in Asia. Um, uh, you know, these protocols under AFTA, trade in goods, trade in services, um, intellectual property, digital. What do we do about digital? 1% of the globe's data capacity is in Africa, a huge continent with 1% of data capacity. We need to be digital to uplift our communities, to allow people to run their small businesses, to, to, to submit uh, comments on legislative processes. Talk about capacity. People have mobile phones, they send M-Pesa. We can send comments to the legislature. Um, you know, we just need to get that infrastructure in place. Um, 
opportunities are there. Academics submitting to su submitting papers. Um, trade lawyers, you know, lobbyists lobbying your ministers of trade and industry to push in a direction that makes sense in line with the broader vision. Um, you know, climate change, sustainable development. Well, how are we developing, and in what direction? Lots of questions. Lots of scope for us to contribute. Lots of opportunities. Um, <laughs> A key point that I want to just elaborate on, someone made it earlier, is, is infrastructure. We need infrastructure, we need schools, we need roads, we need ports. Um, there is a report out by McKinsey, 80% of African infrastructure projects fail at the feasibility, feasibility and business, business plan stage. Why is that? There, there's this perception that there's a lot of risk attached to African infrastructure projects. Um, the same report suggests that there's $550 billion worth of assets held in pension funds and DFIs and whatnot that could be directed towards African infrastructure projects. Um, we need $108 billion odd dollars a year to get things done. How do, we, how do we get the wheels of industry working? How do we create a regulatory environment that is conducive to projects, the projects that we need? And how is we how can we as lawyers contribute to that? Lots to think about. Um, I'd recommend that Dr. Dr. Fowers, uh, in his upcoming tenure, uh, looks at some looks at, at some e ALS projects and submissions that we, as a collective, as lawyers from the seven different countries, can can work on and contribute towards. How do we get it done? Thank you. Thank you very much, Ryan, and um, we apologize for rushing you, um, but you summarized it very well, and we, we thank you. You talked about uh, theory within practice, and you said without rule of law, there cannot be any integration, and integration will be difficult. Um, you talked about the political goodwill to get things done. We have a lot of um, things done by the politicians at the top, whereas probably it should be the bureaucrats and the lawyers, people who have better knowledge. Um, doing these. Yeah, you talked about the role of digital, climate change, and infrastructure on everything that we, uh, we're trying to do as far as integration is concerned. So we thank you very much for that. Please give him another hand. <laughs> and now our last but certainly not least um, panelist we have from the Democratic Republic of Congo, Dr. Joseph Yav who is the founding partner of YAV Associates, which is from the Democratic Republic of Congo. You're most welcome. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Jambo, bonjour, Mbote. Yes, the DRC is big, but we are still baby. Well, as we just joined the ESC. But we think that in a few, in few years, we'll become bigger than the other six countries. I will raise some, I will address this, uh, uh, my, uh, my presentation by raising some points. The first one, I heard that in Congo, we do have the 27 bar associations. Let me clarify that. We have one bar, one national bar association. The Congo is big. Previously, or five years ago, where DRC uh, got how many? 11 provinces. But with the decentralization, we have now 26, 26 provinces. So our bar, the, we have national bar, and we have provincial bar, local bars. Our bars are linked to the court of appeal. So in each province, we have a court of appeal. Myself, I'm a lawyer belonging to the DRC because I have a registration number with the national bar. But I'm linked, I'm a member of three different provincial bars where I have offices. Logumbashi, that is toward the Zambia, Kolwezi, those are the mining area, 
rich mining area and Kinshasa, the capital city. But um, I work in the entire country, the DRC, because I'm a lawyer registered at the National Bar. So yes, if we say, if we screw the National Bar, in each province we have one bar association, provincial or, uh, provincial or local, except in Kinshasa. In Kinshasa, where it, that is the seat of the national, but in Kinshasa we do have two courts of, two courts of appeal, and then there is two, uh, two separate bar association there, and I belong to one of that. So that is clear. We, we came here as one to join the EAC, uh, the uh, community, and so on. That's the first, that the first remark. The second remark, I would like for this integration, for the ESC integration, there is an issue of language barrier. So we have to address the issue. I was mm -hmm. with one of my colleagues from Uganda, you, you shall see, we were in Miami, because we are a member of the I, IBA. We find that there's only Nigerian. Most of the Africans are from Nigeria, lawyers, Nigeria. But they're asking us, other Africans, to join, to be in member there. Thank you. To be in member, but I say no, but there is an issue. I can speak some English. But my other colleagues from my country, even in Rwanda, no, Rwanda now, X, yes, but Burundi sometimes may be difficult. So if we want to, to play, the, 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 uh, we need the real integration, people should also speak pretty easily their language. We speak Swahili. My Swahili is not, <laughs> my Swahili is not as good as, as good as yours, but I can understand what they're saying, I can speak. But sometimes, it's I, was, I was surprised here, uh, I was looking for tomato, tomato with, uh, with, with onion and uh, nanini. And I said, no, it's nyanya. Nyanya for me is another thing. In French, it's aubergine. Nyanya is aubergine. What is aubergine? I don't know. Huh? Let me address two issues quickly. The DRC belongs, yes, to uh, several RECs. But by joining the East Africa community, it was on purpose. Why? Firstly, on the security issues. So we joined the ESC because when we, re we read the treaty establishing the ESC, there is this, uh, you, you promote peace, and you address the issue, issue of the securities. So it's better sir, that the members, rightly yesterday, Mama Samia, she talked about that, that the, at the eastern part of the Congo, there's issues that have to be addressed by the, uh, the, 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 the country. Thanks, there is a regional force and so on. Secondly, there is still things of economical and so on. The BDRC, we are big. We have more than 90 million people. It's an opportunity for the ESC. We, we have natural resources natural resources, but the, the bad thing with us, we do export, we do export our natural resources. We import mm -hmm. everything, including food. So by joining the Eastern African community, it's also a market that we are bringing, but we also expect to get industries and uh, investors to come and develop as far as the, the, the agriculture is concerned, as far as the, the, the industrialization and so on. So being together will be more stronger than the DRC remaining in the subject only or in the, the Central Africa only. And we are closer. The DRC is the only country within the region, the Eastern African country, that have five or six members, members of the EAC. That's being by, by, by that position. So we have the right to be here and to speak. But to speak, we have to speak in English. Swahili. <laughs> Finally, yes, the DRC bring strength and weakness, but the trend, our trends are more. If we put in the balance, our, we put more than what you can fear with, uh, for us to, to, to be with you. So we plead for peace, development, and prosperity. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Doctor, uh, for defining various regional bars, explaining why 
You have regional bonds and the national bond. That's very good to hear. Uh, you stress the language barriers, uh, the reasons why the DRC has joined the East African community, national resources, exploitation, and you've also told us uh, how DRC has five neighbors, and hence the need to really join if we don't have any development. Um, we have run out of time. Um, do we have time for one or two questions? Two, okay, we'll have two questions, one and two. The rest of you can approach the panelists after this, and um, they'll answer. So let's have our first question. Please uh, introduce yourself and be very brief, and uh, inform us to which panelists you're directing your question. Anyone who has other questions can approach the panelists um, during the lunch break. the envisaged East African Federation to be the global power of Africa. When I heard all the presentations, I did not hear anything commenting on how we are going to overcome those people don't want us to unite to become the global power of Africa. Help me with that. Thank you. Okay, your question is uh, uh, in that uh, which panelist? Uh, to introduce yourself, please. Okay. Uh, my name is Ibrahim Bendera. My title is uh, Captain Ibrahim Bendera. I'm a captain of ships, so, so thank you. Um, I think, Stephen, you'll be able to answer that. Let's get the second question. Second question, please. Sorry, Dr. Sarah Bilete from Kampala Center for Constitutional Governance. My question goes to Mr. Nunzmena Stephen on the expansion of the community. Whereas there are many benefits to derive from the expansion of the community, I have questions on the rushed manner in which we admit members. The minimum standards for other regional groupings is a phased process of admitting members through the observer status, co-opted member and then full member as you do capacity building on the requirements for compliance. And we have seen the tabulates on compliance with South Sudan. I don't know how it will go with DRC. And now we are quoting Somalia to join the community. Why don't you do a phased process of admission and capacity building for new members? Thank you. Thank you very much. Those are two questions for Stephen Nielsen. Um, if you could reply them in that order and as quickly as possible. Yes, you can. Uh, thank you very much, uh, my sister Sarah, for that, that question. Maybe let me start with that very one. The admission of new members in the community uh, is a mandate of the summit. That one is not a delegated function. The admission criteria is spelled out in Article 3 of the treaty, and we have uh, the prerequisites, the, the qualifications for a member, including ge geographical proximity, including rule of law, access to justice, and also we have the the admission, the, the, rules of, the rules for governing admission, but the processes involve verification. For example, uh, the, the, Federal, the Federal Republic of Somalia applied in 20, 2012, but uh, we have been directed by the summit to establish and expedite the constitution of a verification team to ensure that we do verification. So when a partner state has applied, 